All right, we are live from New York City. Cool. Saturday Night Live. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, that's right. So this event is called Cancel Culture and Critical Media Theory. We are going to be joined here, uh, I think maybe even right now as I speak. No, maybe? Um, no, someone else. Okay. We'll be joined briefly, I think, by Norman Finkelstein, who is going to be here in the flesh, but things have happened that made it so he's not able to join us in the flesh, um, which is okay because he should be joining us by Zoom. Um, and so we, the order of the occasion is going to begin with Nick Casalucci talking about difference as such. Then it will be Samuel Wankar talking about... Uh, you have special words for it, but basically the alphabet and printing and uh, media in general. And it's really a, an amazing contribution um, to the field of critical media theory, which is an emergent field. It's not a, a field taken seriously enough in academia today, but it is probably the single most important field if you care about understanding the world that we are in, what, it, what our devices do to us, uh, the, our current historical situation, and if you, especially if you care about things like social change, because uh, all of your efforts will be in vain if you do not understand this, the situation we are in today. Um, but then Norman Finkelstein will present on cancel culture, identity politics, and what we can learn from what happened with Bernie Sanders. Um, these are all based on contributions to the Underground Theory volume, which you will find out more about when Ann presents, who, and uh, basically Ann, Nance, and then myself, we are the Theory Underground Tour 2023 crew, and we will, we will do all of that. Um, like short little, like here's what the books are about, here's what's going on in the tour, blah, blah, blah. We'll save the info for after. I kind of want to just get right to the presentations though because this is an expensive space, and so we want to utilize it wisely, and so, um, I will just say a couple things about Nick Casalucci. He His piece is one of my favorites in the volume. He's one of my favorite people on the internet. This was our first time meeting in real life. It's very exciting. Um, he's kind of one of these D class A PMCs, which is to say, like me, someone who was in the university but also not seeing a future in it and still having to figure out a way to exist knowing that he enjoys teaching but also not really seeing that path forward. And so um, that's, that's that. But more importantly, he's really into Lacan. He's really into Lacan and Slavoj Žižek. In fact, he is one fourth of the young Žižekians, right? Which is a sort of loose conglomerate of four people. I mean, it's like, <laughs> we all have our own projects, but we get together, like, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like when the Power Rangers or whatever do their thing, you know? Yeah, that's, we do that sometimes. And, uh, He's also one half of the Vanishing Mediators with Andrew Flores, who will be, we will be meeting him tomorrow. So we get to meet all of our internet friends on this tour, and it's very exciting. So please put your hands together for Nick Casalucci. Thank you. I think we should, we should, yes, yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. What a lovely introduction. Um, I didn't realize I was going first. So let's get this out of the way. No, I know, I'm very difficult to contact, very incognito. I like it that way. But thank you again for the nice introduction. Um, I thought I would just read some of my piece. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. I thought I would just um, whet everybody's appetite for this essay I wrote. You can read the rest if you buy this beautiful volume we've got here. You can buy it. You could Tear the pages out, make little paper airplanes out of them if you're not into the essay. Do whatever you want with it. But I will get started. Yes. One thing I'll uh, say also for all the speakers, sorry, we didn't have time to like prep speakers, but probably keep it back here kind of and just project a little bit for the people back there because we haven't figured out how to make your voice also come out of the speakers yet without causing a lot of audio problems. So just kind of like this. Okay. And, and then that will catch you. It'll be good. So. All right. I'll try to tap into some of my teaching skills here. A um, little bit about this essay. It is about the concept of sexual difference as formulated by Lacan. Difference in Lacanian theory, psychoanalysis, 
somewhat loaded term might not mean what you think it does at first blush, but um, yeah, I draw heavily from Alenka Zupancic's work, What is Sex, uh, Slavoj Žižek's Sex and the Failed Absolute, and the, the seminar, Lacan's seminar. So um, yeah, I will just jump into it then. <clears throat> All right, difference as such. And Dave, you'll cut me off. Just tell me when to stop and I'll shut up and sit down. All right, in the summer of 1997, the Washington Times celebrated its 15th anniversary. The newspaper, known for covering topics from a conservative point of view, received praise from personalities such as George Bush Sr. and Orrin Hatch. And for the first few hours, proceedings unfolded as might be expected. Hollow plaudits, dreary acapella, cameo appearances by Washingtonian fossils, the publication's supposedly unbiased reporting and overall fairness of outlook were praised while the soak the rich rhetoric of other outlets was decried. Ordinary fair, and then suddenly a dramatic shift in tone. To the stage arrived the Reverend Sun Young Moon, founder of the Christian Fundamentalist Unification Church, officiator of mass weddings and self-designated instrument of God's will. For those who knew the good reverend, his speech that evening, punctuated by moments of self-aggrandizing bombast, was predictably grandiose. But for those DC apparatchiks unfamiliar with the cult leader, his Jeremiah entitled True Family and True Universe, centering on true love, came across as, to put it lightly, unceremonious, if not overtly deranged. In the course of his diatribe, Moon railed against the modern era, depicting it as one corrupted by free sex and moral degradation. Uh, this is a quote from Moon. Absolute sex is centered on God, and free sex is centered on Satan, he avowed. Speaking towards a solution, he prescribes the following. Historically, world literature and the media have often uh, stimulated free sex. But from now on, you literary figures and journalists should lead the way to prevent free sex. Free sex should completely disappear. Maybe the most intriguing of the statements given by Moon that evening was contained in his theorization of the divine rationale underlying the design of male and female anatomy. And this is a quote from Moon. What is the difference between man and woman? Their bodies, including the sexual organs? Then to whom is man's sexual organ absolutely necessary? Man's sex sexual organ exists for the sake of woman. The human sexual organs are shaped as concave and convex. Why are they shaped that way? Both of them could be pointed, or both could be flat. Why are they shaped differently? Each is for the sake of the other. Woman absolutely wants what is man, and man absolutely wants what is woman's. Until now, we did not know the fact that, absolutely, woman's sexual organ is man's, and man's sexual organ is woman's. By owning each other's sexual organs, man and woman come to know true love." End quote. What strikes us about this passage? The argument is predictable. Its logic remains fully aligned with the basic premises of most Christian accounts of sexual poverty. Rather, it is the reverend's emphasis on the shapes of the sexual organs themselves that leaves a strange impression. Why this reduction of a spiritual bond to the status of a symbolic truth evidenced by anatomical materiality, convexity, concavity? Moon argues in favor of a union sanctioned by God of the combination of two substances which reflectively body forth a latent essence. From this perspective, the joining of man to woman renders both genders complete, as if completion of the unfinished organism by means of a dyadic union were a promise inscribed into the very, se uh, very self-presentation of the sex organs. Male and female essences are only brought to a state of wholeness within this divinely sanctioned arrangement. Such, such justifications for the gender binary are, are all too common. One need not look further than the rhetoric peddled by the typical right-wing pundit or megachurch pastor to find appeals to anatomical symmetry used to support arguments against gay marriage. Man was made for woman. Marriage should only ever be between man and woman. The arguments against such flimsy apologies for complementarity are obvious and need not be refuted here. At the other end of the arena, we find an opposed theory, Butlerian gender as performance. 
already a commonplace in most modern accounts of gender, academic or otherwise, such a conception views gender as socially generated, conditioned, and prescribed. This perspective understands gender dynamics as constituted by a performance stage for the benefit of other performers. Gender exists to maintain the dominant hegemonic structure of society by limiting the scope of one's individual possibilities. As a result, acceptable masculine and feminine modes of deportment become rigidly codified into a set of directives. The only way to break out of this directive-bound gender binary is, therefore, through experimentation with one's unique identity, allowing oneself to blend into one's gender performance those ingredients traditionally considered incongruent with the basic recipe for masculinity slash femininity. This process of experimentation is liberatory because it fosters an identity better synchronized with the fluctuations of supposedly inborn psychic coordinates which had, prior to the intervention, been subjected to draconian measures of social repression. Identification with a specific denotation within this spectrum need not be a permanent label. For many, fluidity, the attempt to capture the quicksilver play of the orientation process itself serves as the end goal of identity construction. Such a seismic shift in discourse should certainly be tallied as a win for those who have always felt suffocated by the yoke of gender bipolarity, and even the most cynical of leftists cannot but admit that the entrance of these issues into mainstream discourse marks a progressive change. One is potentially promising of emancipation for binary nonconformists, as it is threatening for those who feel their way of life is called into question by this discourse. But are these two sides, gender essentialism and gender fluidity, really ontologically opposed to one another, or do their premises not depend on a mutual assumption about what in sexual identity qualifies as essential, namely essence? And so our exploration will span a reach seemingly bookended by two positions which are only apparently antipodal. Gender essentialism, as supported by devotees of sexual complementarity and gender deconstructivism, as practiced by advocates of gender fluidity. Demolition of the former stance is, for us, low-hanging fruit, while, pragmatically speaking, the latter position would, on the surface, warrant our unqualified promotion. As many cultural theorists and philosophers believe the transgressive capacity of gender fluidity can prove to critically undermine relations of domination within capital. The assumption being that the living out of this identity will enable the subject to address their gender dysmorphia without shame while engendering a new perspective from which the patriarchy can be shown in its truly oppressive and authoritarian colors. So at first glance, these two poles, gender essentialism and gender deconstructivism, couldn't be more distinctly opposed. How could, very broadly speaking, leftist belief in sexual identity qua amorphous substance have anything in common with a conservative understanding of sexual identity which po would posit it as one half seeking its other, a yin to be yanged? Are both gender essentialism and gender deconstructivism not premised on the possibility of an actualizable identity? Is this identity once brought to fully embody the criteria of its own potentiality, whether in the dyadic configuration of heteronormative union or through the dynamic arrangement of identity markers lying along an unbounded spectrum, not dependent on a notion of authenticity? And would this authenticity once realized not disclose for the individual their proper place as a subject in the world? For Moon, the reality of the soul is an essence of which the respective shapes of male and female sex organs serve as symbolic testament. One answers God's call by entering into wedlock with a member of the opposite sex. For the liberal personality engaged in a habitual play of identity, this activity itself is thought to procure access to an inner essential authenticity, one pursued in accordance with a gesture defiant of the sexual manichaeism that originally fogged up this image of a true self. In either case, the strategy aims at the procurement of authenticity. Obedience to God is, for the Mooney, a member of the Unification Church, staked in the proper usage of sex organs, its proper mode of disposal being that of a gift donated by husband to wife, while for the liberal personality, the final moment is an ever-expanding embrace of a multiplicity of identity predicates under the umbrella of a singular invariant subject, whether predicated of a single unique complementarity, essence, or a variety of definitional qualities. Both narratives presuppose the identity of uh, the subject as invariant in relation to itself. To preserve the subject is to bring it to its sexual terminus ad quem, that is to finalize the subject in an act of definitive predication. 
end it there. And then, yeah. you know, maybe, uh, actually, so. I think we do have time to take a couple, just a couple questions that would help you maybe just elaborate on kind of, this is kind of a teaser, everybody. Sure. It's like a teaser of the piece. Um, and so I will let everyone think about what question they might want to ask, but if you want to just kind of like talk a little bit about the rest of it. Um, say. Yeah, so the rest of the piece basically explores the Lacanian understanding of the subject, which would in some ways like take up the thread of Cartesianism while rejecting the sort of self-reflexive, transparent ego that is inherent in this um, understanding of the subject, which, you know, like Heidegger does something similar but in many ways it's like Lacan resuscitates Descartes in this respect, but for very different reasons. And um, it's really hard to, to summarize all of the ins and outs of how he does this. I'm far from understanding it yet, but essentially the subject is an impossibility. Um, it is not the specular ego, which would be tied up with a self-image, who we imagine ourselves to be in the world, how we represent ourself as an object for others. Uh, the subject is a, I would almost call it a pseudo-reality, because it is a manifestation of the Lacanian real. You know, there's this, the three registers of symbolic, imaginary, and real. Uh, it's a liminal category between being and non-being, which is generated paradoxically from its impossibility to be. But what complicates the matter further is the fact that the contingent form that this takes in the world, that the subject assumes, is not a sort of desexualized Cartesian ego, it is, as Lacan puts it, a, a sexuated being. And sexuation is a category that is neither biological sex nor socially determined gender, but something like an unconscious choice that is wrapped up with how we, how we enjoy. And of course, for anyone who's even a little bit familiar with Lacan, you will know enjoyment as jouissance. It is not the kind of enjoyment that we feel when we successfully gain pleasure from something, but the sort of enjoyment that surpasses the limit. In, in the case of Freud and the drive, the limit of the, the pleasure principle. So I hope that wasn't too rambling. Try my best to sort of condense it. Um, we, we really, I mean, I, I, it's my fault. I put you in a really weird situation. No, I, all good. I tried to call you all day, but I had an old number for you. Apparently. Yeah, I should have. Yeah. Uh, um, so my first, I, I, no one else has raised their hand yet. Anybody have a question? How does this relate to cancel culture, identity politics? It does relate to identity politics, and then I guess by extension, cancel culture. I mean, it, I think that with the... The, the kind of censorship and, and limiting of the discourse on the basis of like terminology that we get from liberal takes on, on, on gender, uh, that it, it, it's extremely restrictive, as we know. And why I think Lacan is potentially liberatory or even emancipatory in this sense is because he invokes a third category. And it's one that by no means excludes gender fluidity as a possibility. It, it in fact, you know, many have argued that psychoanalysis is at essence a, a critique of patriarchy. But it's one that undermines the patriarchy to me in a way that's so radical, radical to the point that 
it sounds like the opposite because when you're talking about um, the sexuation and the feminine position versus the masculine position, it would seem like he's just reintroducing a basic bipolarity into the argument and trying to like reify it at a psychic level when it's, it's far from that. Essentially, it's like for Lacan, uh, feminine sexuation the fe uh, and the impossibility of that identity is sort of what cuts masculine identity in half, what makes it unrealizable. But it's in this impossibility to realize masculine identity that, that, that it's constituted. And there's a mathematical dimension to this that I'm still trying to figure out myself. I think it's what, it, what puts a lot of people off from Lacan, but what I believe is really at the core of what his entire system is, is building to. I don't know if that, it didn't address your question about identity. No, politics. that does a great job, yeah. yeah. Basically that um, the way Americans especially think about identity is insufficient and that there's a post Heideggerian critique of Cartesian subjectivity that Lacan develops that would make Americans, well, it would benefit us to, yeah. to get certain ideas from it. I mean, and for example, not a big Lacanian, doesn't really get Lacan, but has already gotten some benefit from, it, from, from this. Like, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but. I mean, just the concepts of like jouissance and drive and then thinking about it in relation to like cancel culture and the ways in which maybe people are like experiencing those two things through it has been like interesting to me and I think a really important application. And then also just jouissance and drive, like seeing it in your own lives and other people's lives. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that it, it doesn't really come together until this concept of sexuation is calculated into it, but I, I, th I think it's a lot to, to grapple with because as, as we discovered learning for they know not what they do, all together, Lacan, Zizek, ideology critique, it's something to really tarry with. And um, yeah, I am, I am daily, so it's like, well, you saw what Slavoj wrote for us today, it's like he's, after all these years, it's like, what did he say? If, if, if my theory is not appealing to workers, then I've basically failed in my task. So it's, it's about taking concepts that are considered extremely abstruse and out of the reach of, of people who are not in the ivory tower and bringing them to the masses. And I'm convinced, and I know Mikey's convinced, and Dave is convinced that there are ways to articulate these concepts that will create a third way for people. And I think that's the idea, yeah. Thanks, Nick. Good. Thank you. When, when I was talking to Norm about this change in plans, uh, and for those who are just joining us late, uh, that change in plans was basically that he can't make it in the flesh. We're like 36 minutes away from his house, but he doesn't have a subway or a car. And we were like, well, we can come. And he's like, look, it's a 21st century. I'm just going to use Zoom. You know? And it's like, all right, man, cool. But then we were like, we do really hope to meet you in the flesh, though. So maybe we could come over after and we you know, at least you know, hang out for a little bit. I'm thinking a couple wires might have got crossed, and he just thinks we rescheduled to eight. So now he's off taking a bath or whatever. You know, just like literally hanging out, just like, okay, I have some time to go run some errands, or who knows? Who knows? So now I'm a little like, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're all kind of like holding our breath here to find out because we really hope that he will join us soon. Um, one of his main compatriots has been trying to reach him by phone, so we'll see. Um, so, uh, it could be interesting, who knows? Uh, but 
I'm about to introduce to you all, well, let me just introduce you to Samuel Longcar. So Dr. Samuel Longcar is someone who I think I discovered through Facebook. Just I am in uh, Facebook groups for all kinds of philosophers and theorists. And there was a video that he did about his dissertation uh, related to how people mistranslate being in time and being in time, anything related to being in time, I'm going to check it out because that's a formative book for me as it is for some of the other people who are here. And so uh, I, I watched it. And I remember thinking, wow, we need more people like this on the internet, this, this, this cool cat. And so I established contact. We talked a little bit. I brought him on for the 30 hour live stream that I did back in March. It was a two day event. Um, several of you were involved with that. Nance was there for the whole freaking thing and did her first live stream ever solo um, so that I could take a break from the 30 hour live stream because it was a lot. Um, and when Samuel joined us, I thought we were basically just going to talk about one of his videos that I'd found interesting, which was the idea of philosophy as a form of psychotherapy. And I knew that he also feels that or thinks he approaches religion that way as well. So religion and philosophy, both as forms of like some kind of psychotherapy. I hope I'm not doing an injustice to your position, but the um, his whole approach to it is very, I felt humane and sympathetic to all of the sides of these kinds of polarized culture war divides such as atheism versus uh, theism. Um, and his, and I, I, I noticed that he refuses to uh, pander to the polarity that the algorithmic conditions of a site like YouTube encourages us to play into, right? And so I admire that. And I, I admire that in anybody who refuses the, the bells, whistles, and carrots that are being dangled out in front of us to just make us produce bullshit, right? And it, it never starts that way. It starts out good and then we get seduced into it. And that's kind of been one of the meta conversations we've been having at Theory Underground on this tour is the idea of like, you can like leave the university because it was sucking away your soul and you didn't want to uh, stop researching the things you genuinely care about because you were, you know, you were getting too inundated by all the bureaucratic acrobatics and red tape and teaching the same class over and over and over and over again and never getting to research the things that you care about, never getting to really spend time with smaller classroom sizes. Um, you can leave the university because of those stultifying conditions and still sell out because you're chasing the algorithm. And so I, w I admire the fact that Samuel is in these institutions still, but maintaining his integrity and also doing stuff online, doing stuff with public philosophy because he thinks that we are in a revolution. And so what he's going to be talking about today is uh, characterizing the kind of revolution, media revolution that we are in the midst of. And that's very important because we all feel at some gut level that the devices that we use uh, that get introduced into our lives, the different platforms, the different apps, the different capacities that they have change something about us, changes something about the message, right? And obviously McLuhan was way ahead of his time when he said that the medium is the message, when he predicted the internet 30 years before its invention. Uh, and at the same time, we haven't moved into a global village so much as something else, right? And so trying to understand what that something else is and what its problems are in a structural sort of materialist um, way it's pretty important for understanding cancel culture, which is something people usually just talk about as though, hey, some people have bad ideas, and so we're gonna critique their bad ideas because we don't like the mode they're in. We don't normally think about the way that the medium has something fundamental to do with that mode, right? And so uh, Samuel is uh, ahead of his time, I think, on this, but there's also a lot of other kinds of uh, synchronicities between his Becoming Human project and what he's doing with Marginalia. And uh, so we're, we were really excited to meet him yesterday. We went to see Gutenberg, which is a new show on Broadway made by the two guys who made the Book of Mormon. We had a ball, uh, we had, a ball. We had some laughs, um, and uh, we, we, we hung out for a while. And yeah, Samuel, I hope that everyone here will get a chance to meet you and hang out for a little bit afterwards. Um, but for now, how you come up here and talk about what you uh, contributed to our volume. Everyone, thank you.
buy it in principle if you haven't. I edited a review of books and I told Dave and Nancy and Ann yesterday, it is the best edited collection I've read. They're not bullshitting. You can look at my review of books. We have over 100,000 readers a year. We've reviewed some of the most important academic books. This book is a really stunning edited collection and it's in tribute to what's happening academically outside of mainstream academic institutions. I taught, as did my friend Brad, we taught both at Yale where we did our PhDs and the intellectual caliber in this volume and the intellectual caliber represented by what Dave is doing is better than the students that I've engaged in the Ivy League. That's a social fact. It's not a dig at the Ivy League. <laughs> I mean, it is, but it's not, not, it's not done for that purpose. Um, but it's just a social fact, and this is part of the emancipatory power of philosophy, which is what I want to talk about. So, for the human to be born, orthodoxy needs to die. For the human to be born, orthodoxy needs to die. Cancel culture is a contested term. Using it's dangerous. So let's start with the term, and I'll explain how it's part of orthodoxy, and I'll explain how orthodoxy is part of the birth of philosophy, and how philosophy is part of the emergence of the human. And I'll try to do it in the 25 minutes. So um, I'm a little anal about brief, so I'm going to try to fulfill the brief. So um, cancel culture is a word that if you use signals you're outside of a certain social class already, so it's very dangerous. In fact, when Dave told me the title of the event was cancel culture, I'll be honest, I was a little nervous. I was like, you know, it's like I'm not sure I really believe in cancel culture. If you're respectable, you're not supposed to believe it exists. Right? There's always been a social class of people who won't use the word political correctness, even though it's obviously real. And the reason they won't use it is because people like Peter Thiel were writing books about it when they were in grad school at Stanford in the late 1980s. So there's already class warfare about terms. So let's start with class warfare. And the most important form of class warfare here is intra-upper class warfare. The upper class defines the media, culture. They define everything we see in television as supposedly normal people living in multi-million dollar Manhattan apartments. Right? Every sitcom you know assumes the people you're watching are trust fund kids because how the hell could they live in that space in New York? And you can say, well, don't be a jackass, it's television. You're not supposed to take it literally. But television and movies in Hollywood depict the lives of only the top decile of our country. Yet I was recently watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off at my gym because it's so lazy, they have a theater room. And I'd never been in there and I was like, wow, I guess I could watch a movie, let's see what's on. So it's Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and I was just struck, uh, you know, all these years. But it's like it's this beautiful, very upper class setting, which is fun. It's, I assume it's not the setting most of us come from. If we did, that's great. It's wonderful to have a house that probably cost $3 million even in 1990. But we don't think about the fact that all of the media is controlled and produced by the upper class. All of it is only acceptable if it's acceptable to the upper class. And then other people like it or don't like it in some complicated relationship to their so-called desires and their desire to be part of a class that economically they know they'll never join, but that they dearly hope will affirm them and accept them or they'll have no career. So this is a class structural condition about modern media ecology, which is modern media is largely controlled by the upper class, but modern media therefore exposes the upper class in a way that has never before happened. So this expose of the upper class is the revelation of the unconscious id of the upper class. So from a Freudian standpoint, generally the upper class had nothing to do with the lower classes. There's a great quote, I, I think I put it in my essay. Um, there's a quote by the Governor Raleigh of Virginia in the 1670s. He said, thank God that the people can't read because literacy leads only to heresy and sedition. And this is a good royalist. He was appointed by King Charles. So it is a simple fact that the crown controlled printing until the 1670s, I believe, Act of Parliament, maybe 1690s after the Glorious Revolution. So the idea of a free press, all of this is insane. It's insane from a historical standpoint. Historically, what people were supposed to believe didn't matter. It only mattered whether anything bothered the upper class and its control of social institutions. This is just a fact. But very crazily, in the late antique period, something emerges through Christianity called orthodoxy, right belief. Right belief is a very dangerous idea, as dangerous as monotheism and very connected to it. Cancel culture is simply one iteration of Christianity. So let's be very, very clear about this. Cancel culture is just a word for orthodoxy. So the reason the word is contested is because some actors in our society benefit from a position of such extreme ignorance 
that they don't want to acknowledge the realities of the conflicts in their own class and in their own ethical system. That class is the class that can afford to say there is no political correctness, there is no cancel culture, these are just terms made up by crazy Trump supporters. That's obviously bullshit, just from a sociological standpoint. If you're a social scientist, you can't say there's not suppression of speech in favor of certain political positions or cultural positions. That's obviously the case. In fact, that's always been the case since we've had orthodoxy. So the question is, why do people do this and why is the term contested? Cancel culture is a contested term because if you use cancel culture, you signal that you believe there's a fundamental division in your society. This is the same thing. Cancel culture is the new political correctness. The use of the term in public itself is dangerous. You're liable to be labeled a right winger by stupid people who think they're on the left, but they're not. Um, just because you like shitting in a particular place doesn't give you an identity. So people whose identity comes only from castigating people from lower classes who support political candidates, whose rationale they can't understand because they're so enmeshed in their wealth and privilege, they don't get to consider themselves true leftists. That's just bullshit wealth speaking again. They're no different than English aristocrats who would be happy to have the poor have their head chopped off. As one historian recently said about the upper class, this is in a Browning poem, the upper class's attitude was, we don't care how the peasants die. So the upper class has never cared how the peasants die. And so the way you kill a term is you say that's a peasant term. Cancel culture is for peasants. There's these seditious, libertarian, smart-ass people from Germany like Peter Thiel who complicate the picture. So there's an internal division in our culture between the Silicon Valley original elites, which have a very radically libertarian bent, where the left and the right meet in a certain real place. That is anarchism, suspicion of the state, links libertarianism with the radical left historically, and a very kind of not radical right in a negative sense, but a libertarian right. But now anything that's anarchist is considered libertarian. This is, of course, nonsense historically and philosophically, but it's important because libertarianism is bad and it's right wing. And so if you can condemn anything anarchist, anything skeptical of the state is libertarian, then you can say political correctness is a libertarian conservative type of conspiracy theory that pretends there's people out there who are trying to suppress our speech. The idea that anyone could have a conversation whose premise is someone isn't trying to control speech is a stupid idea. We ought not to condone with our intellects outright outrages to our intellects. We know in media people are trying to control speech. We know that since the news was invented, it's been controlled for particular political and economic purposes. We know that psychological operations have existed since the investment of public relations in the 1920s by Edward Bernays, who wrote the book Propaganda, explaining what he did. We know Goebbels and the Nazis copied it. We know the CIA perfected it. We know our government has used PSYOPs against foreign governments, and we know our government uses PSYOPs domestically because it's part of their doctrine, as I talked about with Dave and Nance and some others recently. I'll eventually do a course on PSYOPs and the idea of Plato's cave. So this is just look up PSYOPs. Look up PSYOPs US doctrine. And you can literally read what the US government says the purpose of psychological operations are and how they're integrative operations that should integrate the assets of US civil society. Or look at Trevor Paglin, MacArthur fellow artist who recently did a show, you've been fucked by PSYOPs. So the control of speech is obvious. The people who have the political and economic privilege to deny that speech is attempting to be controlled are either genuinely ignorant in a way for which we should have tolerant compassion and offer them books to read, or they are so willfully antagonistic to anyone who threatens their sense of identity that they are willing to ignore and deny the most obvious factual realities around them, and that person is not the most helpful person to have as a conversational partner. Aristotle says you cannot have a conversation with someone who denies first principles, that is self-evident things. So, so the idea that a teacher, for example, doesn't have an interest in regulating the speech of their classroom, if you're a teacher, right, like Nick or Dave, we all, of course you have an interest. It's, not, it's benign if you're a good teacher. You want the class to have a good conversation. You want the smart kids to be able to talk, but you want the kids who might be smart or not so smart and feel shy to be able to talk. You, everyone who is involved in speech has an interest in how speech goes. So first of all, we have to deal with, I wanted to deal with the, the fact that cancel culture is a contested term. The fact that this is part of 
orthodoxy. It's a similar valence to political correctness. This fact signals a class division in the upper class between the most elite establishment class that has what we could say is the, the sort of golden triad in politics of cultural capital, financial capital, and political capital. So Pierre Bordeaux famously, the sociologist in his book Distinction, coined these concepts of cultural capital. But distinction is cultural capital. I read The New Yorker, and what's more, I like it. Uh, this isn't actually true. One of those two things isn't true. I'll let you figure out which one. I do love The New Yorker, and I think their comics are the best thing around. But to say you like The New Yorker and that you like The New Yorker signals class affiliation, nothing else. No one can like everything in any magazine. But there's a type of person who won't ever say, you know that article in The New Yorker? It was stupid motherfucking shit. I can't believe that Remnick published that. No one who wants to signal the class affiliation of being a New Yorker reader will then say that about The New Yorker in the social context in which they will profess to be a New Yorker reader. Why? Because reading The New Yorker has to do with class affiliation, and it's a very New York thing. And I would bet that The New Yorker is most prestigious outside of New York in elite places like DC. That's just a conjecture. But this is just an example of class distinction. It's classic Bordeaux, you, any sociology class, you could learn this. But a lot of people have cultural capital. For example, I went to Yale, even though my dad's from a working class background. I didn't start at Yale. I went to a very anti-prestigious undergrad, then did a very prestigious PhD. So there's a mix. I have not any prestige, really. Because once you get to a place like Yale in grad school, you realize the Ivy Leagues are prestigious in the Ivy Leagues only if you went there for college. I didn't know this. It's like the class stuff gets more and more niche as you go. Because if you can go to the Ivy Leagues or a school for college, it shows that your parents are wealthy. It's that simple. If your parents aren't wealthy, you don't fucking hear about small liberal arts schools. They're not on your radar because they cost $60,000 a year. Or I think Reed College today costs over $70,000 a year. And you can get a great education at Reed, just you can only get it if you can afford to buy a new house by middle class standards every two years. So this is about class affiliation. So class is the most uncomfortable thing. And Nance wrote a great essay about class in the reader. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Class is a vague concept. And the reason I would say class has no political power today is because the concept isn't clear enough for anyone to use. Nance points out very well the Marxist concept of class is vague. It's, it's not very useful from a contemporary standpoint. For example. In an information economy, who owns the means of production? The person who controls the servers of the internet? The media companies that publish the content? The real estate owners who own the digital website access? InfoSec people without whom the sites could easily be hacked and if they wanted to could fuck any of those websites? Who controls the means of production when the means of production are so electronically software mediated? This is a very, very difficult analytical question that Marxists just can't deal with. And as a result, I'm not saying they can't, I'm saying the problem is there's no obvious answer to it. You can't read Marx to understand digital media. So we have a fundamental analytical problem with class. I do agree with critiques that say we should talk about class. I agree I would have voted for Bernie had he gotten the presidential, I shouldn't say that, but it's true. But, but I also suspected he wouldn't. I'm amazed Trump did because Bernie cared about class, and you can tell the DNC hated that, and they suppressed him effectively. So we know class is a real thing. We know there's a way in which it's completely legible, and we don't need to overcomplicate it. I think Dr. Finkelstein's essay does that very beautifully. It's a very clear conception of class. But Finkelstein's essay about class is a very powerful ethical essay that assumes an ethical idea of human equality. And this idea of human equality is an anti-orthodox idea. So now this is now where I'll try to bridge the last part of this from cancel culture as a form of orthodoxy. What is orthodoxy? Historically, in ancient cultures, there was nothing that we call religion. Religion is a modern invention. Most scholars think it's invented in the way we think about it in the 16th to 17th century. The first episode of my show, Becoming Human, I talk about this. All 10 episodes, I go over what I did at Yale and the work I published as a scholar on science and religion. So I'd recommend that if you're interested. So in antiquity, there wasn't any religion because everything was religious. There were gods everywhere, and the gods were connected to everything. What we call politics, religion, civil society, war, none of these were separate. Just to give you an example, oracles were everywhere, and every military general, including Alexander the Great, always consulted an oracle before they chose a battle date or a battle position. 
So people who say the ancient world are a bunch of like Steven Pinker atheists, you know, this is utter historical bullshit. No military operation in antiquity was done without consultation of people that modern enlightenment dopes would call superstitious morons. And frankly, I don't think the people of Aristotle, Alexander the Great, whatever you think about him, I don't think he was a superstitious moron. He was just a normal person of late antiquity who thought you better check all the information you can before you risk your life, empire, soldiers, and reputation in a battle. So the pervasiveness of oracular culture is part of this pervasiveness of the gods. The gods were everywhere. And religious practice was essentially what we would say made you a good person, whether you were pious. It was not whether you belonged to some club or group. There were no religions like this in Greek antiquity, for example. There was piety, which is being respectful of the gods, your parents, your ancestors, not dissimilar to the Confucian idea of filial piety, which is a central doctrine in Chinese culture because of Confucianism. So what we call religions did not exist. Separate sects that say you all are going to hell if you don't agree, none of that existed. So that's a very radical historical thing to understand and we need history. I adopt Kant's maxim to say, philosophy without history is empty and history without philosophy is blind. Philosophers who don't engage the actual historical context of the emergence of philosophy don't understand the emancipatory reality and challenges of philosophy. Philosophy is what brought orthodoxy into being, unwittingly. Philosophers created the first sectarian communities identified by shared beliefs, practices, and ways of life, not ethnic filiation. So the first gender-inclusive, slave-inclusive, cross-class, therefore, cross-gender social movements were the philosophical schools of the Greek world starting famously with the Pythagoreans, who established a political community that they were then expelled from in Croton and therefore came to Italy, as we would now call it today, and influenced the course of all of history. The Pythagoreans looked much more like what we would today consider a radical political monastic sect than an academic department. So philosophy was the real revolution of religion because it transformed what people thought about piety. Philosophers began to say that what you think about the gods matters tremendously, not just how you behave towards the gods. So philosophy introduces the idea of the doxa graphic tradition, the written tradition of the doxa, or the teachings of the philosophers. So this is how we know what we know about the ancient philosophers because of Aristotle and his students, particularly we have the doxographic tradition. So doxa, which can mean glory in some contexts, it means also opinion in Plato, belief in Plato. Doxa is the teaching or beliefs of the philosophers. So ancient philosophy is a way of life, like Pierre Hadot describes, brings the importance of belief and trust into the center of how you understood a religious movement's identity. So the emergence of doxa in philosophy produces dogma. And if you've read Pierre Hadot, you know dogma is part of the philosophical tradition. The ancient philosophical schools were dogmatic. The Epicureans and Stoics were dogmatic traditions that venerated their founders as divine or quasi-divine beings, and they required adherence to the dogma or the dogmata of their teachers. So non-dogmatic schools emerge, but essentially this is the context in which what we call ancient Judaism and ancient Christianity come into being. And what's radical is the following revolution. Ancient Jews at some point began to say, even though other gods exist, they were never monotheistic, I'm sorry if you believe that. No one was ever monotheistic in antiquity in the modern sense. But Jews were monolatrous. They believed you should only worship one god. The Jews were by law bound to worship only their god. They did acknowledge other gods existed. And they often would try to show how they're the same gods, ecumenically you could say. So monolatry, not monotheism. Monolatry is the you must only worship one God, which means this. You have to have one way of life, and one way of life alone is the proper way of life for your group. This is the emergence of what we think of as religion. It comes out of philosophical schools. Christianity adopts Jewish monolatry. There's only one God, and you must worship only this God. No one ever said this in pagan antiquity. Roman emperors served all of the gods. They were responsible for being the lead pious person of the empire. And eventually, after Augustus, they were themselves divinized as gods. 
Christianity, when it became the cult of the Roman Empire under Emperor Theodosius at the end of the fourth century of the Common Era, established for the first time an absolutely unheralded historical revolution. The greatest empire in the world asserting that its God and its God alone was the true God and all other people's gods were false. No one had ever said this. Not the Assyrians and they were slaughtering their rivals, not the Babylonians, no empire, even though they conquered in the name of their God, had denied that the other gods were real or had denied that the other gods should be respected. They just thought, my God's better because I'm going to kick your ass in battle. Look, I kicked your ass in battle. Therefore, my God is better. The whole Jewish Bible is essentially a story about how do you make sense of a historical community that's always lost its wars. Theologically, this is a very big problem. So the reality of orthodoxy is the reality of state-controlled belief. It's the emergence of the Christianization of the Roman Empire that lets people impose with the coercive authority of the sword of the state rigid belief forms. And it's not until printing that this can actually become necessary. Once printing becomes easy to do with the Gutenberg Revolution, which dramatically reduces the cost of print, and you probably know the economic formula, but generally the economists know, historical economists, if you get a significant drop in the cost of transportation or communication, you'll always get an economic revolution. This is evident in the historical economic record. So Gutenberg, it's still printing, was a very expensive business for the printers, but it dramatically reduced the cost of printing and the cost of access to written material, and that revolutionized the world. So it's part of the birth of capitalism, and modern capitalism is related to graphic or print culture. So print culture then means you can have a bunch of just schmucks sitting in a bar saying, hey, maybe the Pope is wrong. This is a very, very dangerous idea. So the monk, if you all should watch Gutenberg if you haven't, but the evil monk sings a song, he worships Satan, and he doesn't want the people to have the Bible because then they can fucking read and know that he's just saying the Bible says whatever he wants. So control over textuality has historically been the way that literacy was defanged. Literacy was exclusive to a cast of elite priests who were themselves coincident with political power. The priest caste who knew hieroglyphs in Egypt, the priest crafts of the ancient New Year's world in general who could do these immensely complicated textual systems. Alphabetic literacy makes writing fucking simple, really simple. Anyone can learn to write very quickly if it's an alphabetic script. Try learning to read non-alphabetic scripts. They're hard to read. My friend Brad is trying to teach me Hebrew. He has X in Hebrew. Any script like this, they're very hard to read. You have to know essentially what the script is saying almost in order to understand what it's saying. So with Gutenberg, the alphabetic revolution took 2,000 years. But from the alphabetic revolution to Gutenberg, now the alphabetic revolution is democratically accessible because it's cheap. And this brings us in the last part to our revolution, which is Gutenberg gone viral. The internet drops the cost not of printing. It drops the cost of publication itself. So here's the radical revolution. Gutenberg is in an era when if you had a print run in Gutenberg's era and you got it wrong, you went out of business, right? Brad knows more about print culture, but if you look at early modern print culture, printers, it was a very high capital intensive business. Hence, it was very important for the formation of capitalism. If you succeeded, you could make an enormous amount of capital, a surplus capital. If you failed, the cost of investment in a press and of setting the press for the text you printed was disastrous. And that's why the two most popular books in English have been the Bible, and I think Pilgrim's Progress, at least historically. So what we have now is that inhibition, which is publishing is risky and it's expensive. So you only publish if you think there's an economic incentive. And the Bible's been the bestseller. So it's a good, good thing to read. It's important. Even if you don't agree with it, it's the most important book for the history of capitalism, literally. So without the Bible, no capitalism as we know it in the modern world because of the role of print. Now with publishing, you can publish at no cost, at essentially no cost. And this means the revolution of alphabetic literacy. It's easy to learn to read. Anyone can do it. But getting to text is very difficult. Texts were expensive to produce still. They were handwritten in papyrus or in codexes. It was still difficult. And most people didn't want to bother reading because there was no separation of the words. It was called scripta continua. And so most people had very educated slaves read out loud for them. And reading was still listening. And they didn't self-vocalize, meaning they didn't talk 
they always sub-vocalize, pardon me. So Augustine sees his mentor Ambrose in the fourth century in, in the Latin world, and he sees him reading without moving his lips, and he's surprised. So all the way into the fourth century, the common era, reading was a act that you still did with your tongue. You either were listening to a person read the text out loud, or you were saying it out loud. In German, they still say vorlesen, to read out loud. A lecture is a vorlesung, a place you read out loud. So the internet in Gutenberg, Gutenberg takes the alphabetic revolution of access to the skill of literacy, it makes that cheap. But it's still expensive to actually concretely access text. Gutenberg makes the revolution of text cheap. So now you can not only learn to read easily, you can learn to access text easily. Now we're in the final stage of revolution in which literacy is going to destroy itself and, or if some people want it to preserve, it'll be reborn. We all now read in light. I'm being read by the camera. I'm being electronically mediated. So when you read on a Kindle or you read Dave's blog or you watch anything on the computer like my lectures on YouTube, you're reading me through light. Light is the most magical but ephemeral medium. We don't write in papyrus. We certainly don't write in stone. We write in light. So writing is now inscribed in the electrical revolution, which was the technological burden of all of McLuhan's work, was to understand what does the electrical revolution mean for human being. Because of the electrical revolution is the revolution of the continuous and the simultaneous against the discrete and the separate. It used to be the communication costs were linked to transportation costs. Once you have electricity, there is no transportation cost for communication once the infrastructure of the wiring has been established. So I can now talk to potentially every human being in the world with access to the internet. And I can do that from New York, because Dave and his team put this event together. And this would have been inconceivable financially 500 years ago. It's magic. So we write in light. Now, light is the biggest problem for orthodoxy, because if publishing is cheap and anyone can talk, everyone will talk. And guess what? They are. And it's much easier to say these stupid peasants when the peasants can't say anything or when they can't write anything. Now then they learn how to write, and then they have to become part of the upper class so they don't have access to publishing, because publishing is essentially censored, literally until the end of the 17th century. And it's still censored today. If you don't think it's censored, you could just call editorial curation is the benign form of censorship. Censorship is curation you don't like, if you want to be just a dick about it. So I'm not saying there's not bad censorship, but there's always curation, and curation means no to some people and yes to others. And guess what? The yeses fit the interests of the curator. That doesn't mean it's bad. It means you have to ask, what are the interests of the editor? So what are the editorial interests behind cancel culture is the question we should be asking. What are the editorial interests behind orthodoxy? Orthodoxy's fundamental mission is to say the problem with the world exists, and it is evil, but it's not us, it's them. That's orthodoxy. Orthodoxy assumes the world has fallen. There is evil in the world, no question. Orthodoxy then tells you where the evil is, and it's always outside of your group. So therefore, orthodoxy is the essence of group politics. It is, as one famous political theorist said, right, politics is the organization of animosities. I think it was Henry Adams, maybe who said that. If that's politics, think of Schmidt's dark Nazi vision. Politics is the friend-enemy distinction. Schmidt's wrong, but he's a good Catholic. That's not politics, that's fucking orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is the friend-enemy distinction that Schmidt says defines politics. And Catholic reactionaries, Nazis like Schmidt and Heidegger, can only think in terms of the friend-enemy distinction because they are reactionary, anti-modernist Catholics. Nothing wrong with being Catholic, but these are the Catholics who absolutely supported fascists and loved Hitler and did everything they could to support the Nazi regime, we should be reading Jaspers, not them as much. So orthodoxy is the idea that you solve the problem of evil by saying yes fucking yes to your group. Whatever the costs are, truth be damned, your group always wins out over them. And this is a beautiful world. It's the world we're all born into. It's the matrix. It's the world that because you're in it, there is no orthodoxy. If a person doesn't believe in cancel culture, there's nothing to say. They think it's something you believe in. I don't believe I'm standing on a floor. I'd sound like a fucking idiot if I said, hey, I believe I'm standing on a floor. Because you'd think, what is the alternate he was considering in his mind? That he was flying in the air? Or that the floor? You don't profess beliefs in things that are unquestionably obvious. So a person who thinks something like cancel culture doesn't exist, 
There's nothing wrong with that. They're just signaling their affiliation to the I like the New Yorker and I don't just read it class. I like the New Yorker too. And I'm not picking on it because I should. I'm picking on it because it's so privileged we can't hurt it. We all still get to read it. David Remnick's not going to come after me. He's a nice guy. He probably just chuckle from a beautiful Manhattan penthouse. As we all want to have to chuckle at people criticizing us. And I hope we do. But there's no threat. I'm using New Yorker because we're in New York. It's cachet. That's, so orthodoxy is, we're not going to publish that. I run a magazine. I know how this works. It's not censorship. You just think, eh, we don't want to go there. Mm. The world is then constructed by those people. Because in power, there's not a lot of difference in power. Power has enough difference to say, I need to be able to sit across from you at a country club and not kill you immediately. And the way you can do that is we can both be in the country club. That requires a $500,000 lowest tier membership fee for the golf club. And then if you're in the golf club, yeah, it's OK, you're a Republican. You might have had the great sin of voting for Donald Trump, but you have the great grace of having been rich. So if you have the grace of privilege, which is grace in this theological world of orthodoxy, you're born elect. I have privilege. I have power. So there's some things wrong with the world, and I, I would love to partner with the plebes, you know, uh, feel invested in the radical movements. But most radical movements are just really upper class kids talking about themselves in grad school. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. We all talk about ourselves. It's just only some people talk about themselves and it becomes news. It becomes history. But that's not, that's not really radical. What Dave, what this is, is radical. And you will in 10 years, I guarantee you, think back and be like, fuck, I'm glad I was there. Because now all the people who thought, I don't know what this is about, where's the, where's the Ivy League stamp of imprimatur? Which you could just say I'm functioning that way if you want. But I don't consider that that way. I'm not an institutional person. I'm not good at the academic game. I publish, I do my scholarship, and I respect and help my colleagues. But I'm not in a conventional university. I run a magazine. So orthodoxy is the fundamental threat to the flourishing of human freedom and diversity. So if people care about diversity, I, I couldn't agree more with them. The issue is, what are our strategies to deal with why it never seems to manifest? And I'll end with just the following considerations about what is correct about orthodoxy and what's wrong and why it's so hard to cure. What's correct about orthodoxy is the world has fallen and humans are their own problem. I hope we can all agree on that. If there was nothing to matter with the world, we wouldn't be here. If there was nothing to matter with our lives, we wouldn't care to improve them. The issue is then, where is evil? Is it in a group? Or is it in the essence of what you will share with anyone you ever recognize as a person you can talk to? So you know what the answer is. The prophetic critique of orthodoxy is always you, the orthodox, by denying your role in the share of human evil, have committed the worst crime of all, which is to only see evil in your opponents. No one denies there's evil in our opponents. No one denies there's Democrats and Republicans or any context you're in politically who are bad and who are worthy of condemnation because people are bad. And in every group, there's some people who are notably bad who do notably bad stuff and don't give a shit about it, and they're therefore very easy to critique by their self-righteous enemies. But the difference between an ethical friend and a prick is the prick thinks that they're fine and great, and you're just obviously a douchebag, part of my language. But this is an adaption of a great philosopher from antiquity who said, don't take splinters out of people's eyes when you've got a fucking tree in your own. The orthodox never think they have a problem, and they're therefore beautifully equipped to enlighten everyone else about what their problems are and how they could be fixed. The, so what's right about orthodoxy is the doctrine that humans are evil and fallen. Or as Dave says in his essay in the introduction, that everything's fucked up somehow. The question is, how do you unfuck everything? Well, if you're orthodox, it's simple. You control the world because you're right. It's actually beautiful how simple it is. It's like the perfect political philosophy for morons. Because you don't have to think about anything. You're born in the right place at the right time with the right ideas, and you live the right life that's really comfortable. And conveniently, that's also the solution to the working class crisis. It's amazing. It's, 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 I, it's a beautiful place. It's a magical fantasy. Orthodoxy is a magical fantasy you could politely call the matrix. Anti-orthodoxy usually emerges from people who don't want to be better than the orthodox. They're angry they're not part of the orthodox. That's why orthodoxy doesn't end. So what's right about orthodoxy is there's evil. What's wrong about orthodoxy is the evil's only in them and not in me, not in my group. And crucially, that your own group shouldn't always be the main focus of your critique. 
I'm not interested in critiquing people who I don't even understand their positions. I should critique myself and my friends because I can do something about myself and my friends. It's not that I think other people aren't shitty. I just think my own shittiness is the biggest problem I'm confronting every day because, hello, I'm the only person I'm always hanging out with. So I have to deal with my shittiness. Otherwise, I can't help anyone else. So I'm anti-Orthodox, and I'm a heretic for that reason. I'm always a heretic, and I don't fit into social groups. That's probably why Dave somehow felt a kindred spirit when he saw me. Is I don't fit well into groups that say, you can do anything as long as you agree with us implicitly that we're beautiful and wonderful, and you'll always agree with us when it really matters. Fuck that. Are you good? Are your ideals true? Otherwise, I'm not going to be loyal to your group. And I'm not against loyalty, but we have to choose what is our God. I'm a monotheist. My God is truth. I don't know what the truth is. I'm a philosopher, so my God is wisdom. I have to find out how do I know what's true. That's really hard. It's called becoming human. If we don't know what's true, our lives suck. If we know what's true and we learn how to act out the truth, our lives get way better. So everyone, therefore, is interested in wisdom. How do you live the way you want? Well, you have to live truly. If people tell you lies all the time, you can't do what you want because you don't have accurate information. So we need truth to live well. We need wisdom to find truth. And you need to believe in truth if you're ever going to find wisdom. So humans are, in this sense, potentially all philosophers. Orthodoxy says, I've solved the problem for you. I found the truth. I've given it to you. All you have to do is trust me and do what I tell you to do, even if it means you'll be a slave forever. At least you'll be safe and you'll know that the world you live in exists. So the world matters to us. It's hard to give up reality. It's not easy. You know, Morpheus says, all I can offer you is the truth. And most of us deep down have a cipher inside of us. And we better get to know that guy because he's the one who's always going to fuck our lives. The guy who says, I should have taken the blue pill. And the orthodox are people who already chose. They don't, they're never going to meet Morpheus. They already chose their pill. That's why, so that's the vanguard of orthodoxy. The vanguard of orthodoxy is the person who will punch you in a riot that you're nonviolently at, who will rape, kill, and pillage, and do it all feeling good about themselves because they know they're right. The people who aren't sure they're right, we tend to be a little less efficacious in the world because we wonder, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I should talk to people who disagree with me. Maybe I should refine my positions and not go out and swing a sword at everyone I happen not to like because maybe it's just a phase of my life because I'm an adolescent or I'm an idiot or whatever. So what's right about orthodoxy? Evil exists. What's wrong about orthodoxy? We know where it is and it's anywhere but us. The solution to orthodoxy, why doesn't it manifest? Because most of us resent the orthodox simply because we can't be part of the group. So you could say, well, what about the really rich kids who are part of the Orthodox group and they want to rebel? Yeah, they make history. They do. That's most of the famous intellectuals in history, including people like Plato, who was an aristocrat, of course, and was descended from Solon on Perictony, his mother's side. So what can we do now? We're all talking. This video could eventually reach 10 million people. Eventually, Dave's channel could have more watchers than mainstream media. And in 10 years, it very well may. Look at... Look at Joe Rogan, who gets more views on his podcast. That's why liberal elites can't stand him. It's not because they watched him, or they don't like the shape of his head, which I would, you know, you can be sympathetic about shallow critiques like that. It's they don't like the fact that he's so powerful and they have no idea why. And it's because he listens to people. He doesn't shut them up and say, hey, you disagree with me, so I hate you. He lets them talk for three hours, even if he thinks they're quite crazy, and I'll call them on stuff. Whatever you think about Joe Rogan, the guy models a type of respect and dialogue that the mainstream media cannot self-righteously act like they've modeled. So the solution to orthodoxy is, I think, just recognizing our shared humanity is the source of our problems, and it's also why we don't have to hate each other, to figure out that we don't know how to solve our problems, but if we acknowledge we don't know how to solve our problems and we genuinely pursue friendship and intellectual training and partnership with fellow travelers, we're going to inevitably live in a better world and have better versions of ourselves than we did before. And there is no human emancipation that is not born from that beautiful, simple, and always realizable ideal. Definitely got time for a couple questions. Um, actually, no, we don't. We don't have time. Okay, actually, we'll do a little panel thing here uh, afterwards. It's 618. Okay. I'm going to say a couple of things uh, in the Finkelstein's absence. 
So, um, can you bring me that really quick? Show of hands, who's familiar with Norman Finkelstein? Okay, ba most of the people in the room. Um, and I just saw a lot of people who's on the YouTube live side, um, sitting in their rooms or working at their jobs, also raise their hands. And so that's very cool. We see you. We see you. Um, Norman Finkelstein is, as the internet people today say, a goat, right? He's an amazing man. I'm currently worried about his health. <laughs> I'm wondering if he's okay. I don't know what's going on, but uh, Nate, who is sort of uh, his, I don't want, like one of his like, like main guys who helps him with public stuff. He's kind of like, if you want to talk to Finkelstein, you go through Nate, right? Nate's freaking out. And we've been calling his phones. We've been trying to get a hold of people. So if you pray, go for it, you know? Anyway, so he has been routinely blacklisted from uh, platforms for about as long as he's been speaking. And it's because he wrote a book, very controversial, called The Holocaust Industry, um, in which he is not saying the Holocaust did not happen, which is kind of like the narrative some people will run with. That is not what he's saying. He's saying, um, as a leftist, and he's an old leftist, as a leftist, class politics matters. And the Democrats in the United States have been using this Holocaust narrative to erase the fact that there's genocide going on every fucking day, right? And not to mention, not aside from genocide and, 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 and uh, the things we do in South America, the things we do in Africa, the things we do in the Middle East, aside from all of these things, there is class exploitation, and planetary destruction, and people who just want to be like, oh, well, this was the worst thing that happened in history, and we're just going to focus on this and getting ours for ours, and it's just standard identity politics at this point. He goes, nah, we need something that's going to benefit everybody. That's why he pushes for like this universalist politics. Um, he talks about the Holocaust industry um, being a form of, of, of ideology. Okay? It's an interesting book. Check it out. He got in a lot hotter water with his book about Gaza which he considers his magnum opus, which I feel really bad about not having read, but I was not really politically conscious at the point that this was most relevant. But the basic point is um, he was always for the two-state solution. That's usually a very centrist position, um, but he was vehemently opposed to the whitewashing of the actual uh, inhumane brutality being done against the Palestinian people. And so, of course, he was being brought to university campuses by the, the, the kinds of activists who eventually developed um, boycott, sanction, it's called BDS. 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 Boycott, divest, sanction. Boycott, divest, sanction. Um, so he, they would bring him. But then eventually he started saying things that offended them as well. So he kind of, he kind of alienated himself from both sides of the debate. And his whole position is, well, I'm a scholar, this is my field, I should be able to have a platform from which to speak, I know what I'm talking about, all the biggest names in the field have recognized me, right? But there's been a conspiracy of silence for about 20 years, and uh, after seeing what happened to Bernie Sanders, he wrote a book called I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get To It. And of course there's a lot of different narratives about why Bernie lost, okay? Oh. Americans hate socialism. No, it's a particular subsection of Americans who hate Medicare for all. Come on, let's be honest. Um, oh, he's an old white man. I, feel, I felt very gaslit when a lot of people who said that were then super gung-ho about Biden. It was kind of a slap in the face like, oh, Biden's great. And it's like, yeah, well, you might not have noticed his fucking gender or color since you care so much, but you know, it's weird. Um, this piece in here is called Identity Politics versus Class Struggle, what the Bernie Sanders campaign revealed. And basically when I had originally reached out to Norm to, talk, to tell him about what we were doing and to see if he would be interested in having something in this volume, he said, you can take 
an excerpt from my current book and then that will be okay. And so then I had like my work cut out for me. I went over the book multiple times like how do I hone in on like the most important part of this book. And so what I did was I took it from the conclusion to part one. It's basically where he is drawing together all of these threads after doing a critiques of these sort of standard radical Democrat, Democrat to radical uh, positions on racial relations in the United States today, okay? Um, so he has a chapter on Kimberly Crenshaw. She's supposed to be untouchable. She coined intersectionality. She coined critical race theory with other people, obviously. Um, and she works at Harvard Law School, and she's not a radical, she's not a leftist, and so he is, as a leftist, critiquing her on the basis of class, which is something she usually doesn't talk about, and if she does, she adds it on as an oppressed identity at the end of a long litany of oppressed identities. Oh, there's gay people, and they have oppression, and there's black people, and they have oppression, and there's working class people, and they have oppression, and it's like, uh, no, he's, he's gonna call that bullshit. That's not intersectionality, right? Class is a fundamental substratum of the relations of production in the society. It's what makes the world go round. And if you are born into the upper class as a marginalized person, you do face oppression. You do face discrimination. That's not unreal. The point is, is a person who is in that position, who just wants to focus on that well, it's very convenient to their class standing, isn't it? And it's obviously like this sort of end of history mentality. Well, we're at the end of history. Let's just make sure that everybody's included in the C-suite. And by everyone, we mean a representative of every group, right? And then whether you're a good or bad PMC is going to be on the basis of how well you authentically be yourself while representing this abstract grouping, okay? I will just say, I can't read this whole thing like I wanted to. Um, we do have a little bit more time than we thought. Uh, we do have enough time for what we had planned to do after Norm. Uh, I'll just say, I'll read the first paragraph, I'll read the last paragraph, and I'll say a couple things. But um, one of the things that this did for me was it made me feel validated as a working class person who was very burnt out after five to six years of Bernie activism, knocking on doors, making phone calls, putting myself out there, saying this matters, right? And I've never done that for anybody before and I would never do that for any Democrat ever because I come from a background where everyone hears every time a Democrat does a bad thing. I hear, I come from a background where everyone has like, the, it's a bad taste in their mouth. I get it. Democrats stand for some good things. I believe that in my heart. I do think that, they're, that most Democrats I know are good people. They really are. Uh, but I'm not going to put myself out there and burn bridges in my life doing activism for someone like Biden, right? It was Bernie's track record that won me over. And of course, all my Marxist friends would sneer and say, well, he's not really radical. Uh, he's not really revolutionary. He should be Lenin 2.0. And so that was something I had to go through. I had to work through. I had to think through. But I, one thing that was most um, impactful on me that I saw was that there were people who I would say are radical liberals, there were people who are radical Marxists, and there were Democrats who all said Bernie can't win, and then they all had their reasons prescribed, prescripted reasons for why, and then after he lost, they just stuck with the same old narrative. They don't think anything new. They've got their scripts, they're in their habitus, that's all there is to it. And I thought, that's bullshit. Because we saw a lot of things happen in that period of time that was pretty scandalous. Like, there was a lot of betrayals. There were a lot of backstabbings. There were a lot of, like, for instance, uh, when Elizabeth Warren tried to pull the, oh, he said a woman couldn't win thing, right? Uh, yeah, Anne just rolled her eyes. The, or when, as he points out in this book, someone like Judith Butler comes forward and kind of playing with her pearls, and she's like, 
you know, he just doesn't get it. He's just out of touch. Judith Butler, maybe you're out of touch, right? Like, I always liked Judith Butler, right? Especially when I was an activist. Genderqueer, non-binary, radical activist. Loved Judith Butler. That really pissed me off. That really freaked me out. I was also like, I'm an intersectional feminist. I was like all about it. And then I saw Kimberly Crenshaw say, yeah, we got the revolution, just not the one that Bernie wanted. She's talking about BLM. And it was like, wow, Kimberly, fuck. You call that a revolution? People smashing some windows and crying in the streets? You call that a revolution? Oh yeah, we'll cry and ask Democrats to do better. We'll try to push them left. You call that a revolution? And of course, Bernie capitulated at the end of the day. He sat down with his mask on and let history pass by at the exact time that everyone was like, can we get a general strike? Anybody? He had the app. He had everybody. We could have shut the freeways down. We could have literally shut everything down. That's the point of a working class movement. The point of a working class movement, as opposed to any other identity category, is that when workers step back from things, shit stops. You can be a marginalized person and step back and people just won't even know. That's sad and that's a form of oppression and that matters, but it's different. It's different. And it is different to be a working person seduced into a political game that you don't understand where you go and you put yourself out there and then you find out the seriousness wasn't really there. And then people say, oh, well, it just has to be. We don't have time for this. That was probably the best shot in a 30 year period. Everyone who's acting like nothing changed really and we just keep going, I don't know how to have serious conversations with them, but they're normies in my life. And a normie is defined by a gamer as someone who doesn't play games every waking moment of the day. Well, a normie from my standpoint as a theory obsessive is just someone who's not into theory. And I'm just saying, the normies in my life they don't get it, and I don't expect them to, because I'm trying not to virtue hoard my education, my social and cultural capital, to make them feel bad so I can sit there and tell them how to fucking be. But I get really mad at the ones who have the relative time energy privilege to sit here and scold working class people because they said retarded or something. Oh, you said a word I don't like. I'm going to make my whole politics about that. Because we can obviously make progress by changing the words people use, right? This is very, uh, I think everyone has probably heard this at this point, but this is the moving chairs around on the Titanic as it sinks, right? And so me at this point, I'm just like, well, the world is burning and there's like, uh, as far as politics is concerned, we just saw like a real shot. Of course, people say, well, once he got in there, he would not have been able to get, okay, whatever. Yeah, I was naive, maybe. But the point is, is if there wasn't a real shot of that working, then why is there a shot of any other political solutions working? And so my position is, yeah, I'm not like this revolutionary, like burn it all down because I don't think we have anything to replace it with. No one's got any blueprints, but I definitely look at what currently exists and I say, that's a dead end. Identity politics and cancel culture, as Finkelstein develops in this piece, is not just a way of driving wedges between people. It's a way of hijacking movements. And we saw it. There were a lot of influencers who were super pro Bernie and overnight, it's like nothing changed. The old fight goes on, now send me a super chat. The old fight goes on, sign up at my Patreon. All of these influencers, all these talking heads who had been pushing the left lefter who were saying, yeah, Bernie's cool, but he's just not quite right. They just kept acting like nothing really changed. They rode the little uh, boost in the algorithm they got because of the George Floyd protests, and they just leaned into the resist Trump thing, which is its own industry at this point. And it's the end of history. And we're here having a dance party at the end of history. Some of us have hope, some of us do not, some of us are back and forth, but there is no way forward so long as this is the situation. On Twitter, when people were hating on this book, I don't know if anybody knows about it, but it was viral. There was a lot of people hating on this book. The back cover actually has a bunch of the paraphrases, and some of these are direct quotes, of what people actually said. My favorite one is, people who purchased this book should be barred from public life because they didn't like 
one of the contributors or two of the contributors. Some, some of the people just didn't like the graphic design. I'm offended. My whole identity is behind being a graphic designer. I threw it together in 20 minutes and just put it out there, man. I, I wasn't thinking about it too hard. And so this is, the, oh my God, Norm just arrived. Okay, hold on. I will, I've been kind of introducing you this whole time, Norm. Um, but There's a misunderstanding here. You missed all the I'm nice things sure I said. I'm not sure who I you. spoke to this afternoon. Um, I think you're muted still, though. Uh, but... Is this I was told on, that you were coming hear to my place at 8 o'clock. Still not coming through. Um, uh -huh. Well, this was my conclusion to the speaking in lieu of Finkelstein being present with us. And my point was simply this. When people were hating on this book, one thing that got a lot of retweets was someone saying something along the lines of underground when you've got someone as big as Finkelstein, and then someone else said, a the theory? What does Finkelstein have to do with theory? Okay, what does he have to do with theory? Well, the answer is quite simple if you don't just read Deleuze and Guattari, all right? The way that I've conceived it is that uh, after Marx, theory takes two tracks. One is political action, strategy, and basically, it's activism saying, here's what we need to do. It is, as Lenin said, what must be done, right? That's one form of theory. And the other kind of theory says, well, we tried to do it and it didn't work. So what's going on with that, all right? And so I think that Norm's, most of Norm's work has been focused on the prior kind. He sees an injustice in the world, he calls it for what it is, and he holds people's feet to the fire. But after Bernie, he stepped back and said, okay, this ain't working. This whole thing hijacked his, in, his success. And of course, in the live chat, we've got people in there saying, well, I'm not convinced about this cancel culture thing. I think it's made up. Cool, well, why don't you read a book? Uh, I would like you to read this piece. Just get his book. Get I'll burn that bridge when I come to it. Because I do think that Norm's work is the most succinct summary and scathing critique of these tendencies today. By the way, Norm, uh, Nance is still trying to get the speaker thing figured out. So we still can't hear you, but we'll figure it out. So... Why is he in this volume? Because this volume is ultimately mostly people who are trying to say, well, we're fucked. Why are we fucked? Here's why I think we're fucked. So different people trying to say why they think it is. And if we don't understand why we are, then we'll never move forward. There will, it's just going to be this deadlock at the end of history. And yes, we're having our dance party at the end of history. But also, I think a lot of us have some kind of hope that we can actually do something about the stultification of everyone's time energy, that is to say their life force, that is to say everything that we have taken from us through our reduction to being nothing but labor power on call for the dictates of capital or the state, right? To be able to live lives whole and free from all of that. And I...
So the people on YouTube can hear? Norm, one moment. Okay, that should be working. All right, I think we should be good now. No. <sighs> Zoom can hear him. What, why is this in the same system? Okay. No. no. YouTube says they're good. We got it. We got it now. We can all hear you now. Sorry about that. The system on the back side the Bluetooth switched over, yeah. So should I start from the beginning or where I left off? Yeah, where you left off. Okay. So there were various camps in this broad tradition, but even as they vehemently and sometimes violently disagreed over particulars, I still believe, or it's still my impression, that there was one long tradition. And that long tradition, as I said, broadly speaking, was anti-capitalist and a tradition which imagined some kind of what was called socialist or communist future. And there were very fierce debates of a very high level on all sorts of questions. Not just the nature of capitalism and not just tactical questions, but there were all sorts of questions which related to aspects of the struggle for socialism, which were not reducible to the class question. So, for example, if you go back and look at the literature on the topic, there were discussions of what was called back then the woman question. There were debates on what was called the Negro question. There were arguments on what was called the Jewish question. And then more broadly, sort of an umbrella of all of these questions, there was what was called the national question. So this tradition to which I'm referring took as its point of departure, being anti-capitalist, saw the class struggle as being the fundamental struggle. I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong. I'm just speaking about a broad tradition. So the class struggle as being the fundamental question, but also recognizing that there were certain questions which were not immediately and obviously reducible to the class question, of which I said there was the woman question, the Jewish question, um, the Negro question, and broadly the national question, the right of nations to self-determination. And that was the tradition to which I said I identified. That's what made one a leftist. Now, come the period after World War II, uh, and in particular, beginning in the 1960s, the new left domestically and internationally, there were all of the, what were called third world struggles, uh, everywhere from Vietnam to China to Cuba, and the actual struggle for socialism seemed to be unfolding not in the advanced capitalist countries where the working class 
had more or less joined the middle class, uh, the struggles for socialism seemed to be unfolding in the um, what was called back then the third world. So Marxism, or even the aspiration to socialism, had in the era of the new left, uh, had pretty much been marginalized as a tradition and as a political movement. There was really the only example I could think of offhand of what one might call a worker struggle during the 1960s, 70s, 80s was the United Farm Workers, the Chicano agricultural workers who were organizing under Cesar Chavez. That was a national struggle to which all people on the left, I, with which all people on the left identified. Now, beginning in the 1970s, a new phenomenon set in, but it wasn't altogether clear at the time what would be the long-term result. And that is, beginning in the 1970s, and then more manifestly, beginning with the Reagan era, there began a long stagnation in real wages of Americans. And in the course of that process, took a long time for the tendency to play out. In the course of that process, the most decisive uh, transformation was the disintegration of the middle class. And your generation, assuming you are in your, your 35 or below, your generation is feeling the result of that long-term process that began in the 70s and more manifestly in the Reagan era. Two things happened simultaneously, obviously not unrelated. Number one, the disintegration of the middle class, and number two, the vast polarization of the dramatic polarization of wealth. That handful at the top, we called in shorthand the 1%, that's really more like the 20%, about 20% at the top are doing spectacularly well. And the 80% so to speak, at the bottom, that's a very big bottom, <clears throat> the 80% are doing not all spectacularly badly, but all of them doing in one form or another badly. Well, that was a totally, it's a totally different era than the one I grew up in. When I grew up, now I'm speaking of white people, I know I've been called to account on my generalization. I'm speaking of whites. There was another sector of the population which was immortalized by this socialist named Michael Harrington in a book called The Other America. It was a very famous book in my generation. And it referred to those mostly poor white Appalachian workers, Appalachian workers, and African Americans who weren't part of that post-war success story. So apart from them, I'm not trying to trivialize it, but for uh, the non-other America, it was a remarkably uh, prosperous, time to live. 
Uh, the famous line by the owner of Time magazine, which was a very influential magazine in my day. He said, in the United States, everyone is middle class or on their way to the middle class. And that was surely how it felt. That's how it was experienced. My generation never worried about jobs. We majored in whatever we want, however um, irrelevant to the real world the major might be, <clears throat> anthropology, sociology, you major in French, you major in German, you major in psychology, you majored in whatever tickled your interest because there was confidence that when it was time for you to get a job, there would be a job out there. There was never any thought whatsoever given to the possibility that there wouldn't be a job for you. Our generation, a job was always waiting, and I might add, a reasonably paid job, a reasonably paid job with real prospects for promotion, eventually purchasing a home, uh, two cars, uh, you get the idea. So your generation, that hope has expired, realistically speaking, whereas in my generation, about 80% were prospering and 20% were the other America, your generation, it's the worst, the reverse. 20% are prospering and 80% are the other America. Well, this reality, first, it, it was a reality that people live, that's for sure, your generation. I'm not telling you anything about your generation that you don't already know. However, until the Bernie Sanders candidacy, there was no recognition whatsoever, none, of the political potential that this new economic situation had created. And suddenly, Bernie Sanders in 2016 went out on the stump, as it's called, uh, with the with the anticipation that maybe 20 people would show up at a rally here, maybe 30 people would show up at a rally there. And then lo and behold, like mushrooms after a rain, this whole movement, which utterly shocked everybody, emerged with the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. Now, of course, I have to be careful. Nothing comes out of nothing. Uh, there were precursors. There was the Ralph Nader campaign, which most of you are too young to remember. But he was filling places like Madison Square Garden in New York. That was 20 or 30,000 people at what he called his super rallies. But I would say it wasn't yet the working class. It was more the new left, which was held on to its ideals. That's my impression from having participated in it. The next landmark or milestone was the Occupy movement. And the Occupy movement, I think, uh, reflected the new economic reality of young people. I found Sander, excuse me, um, Ralph Nader, they weren't as young. They were, as, as I said, they were the 
1960s people who clung to their youthful beliefs. Occupy now start to show the reality of the young people, the new generation. However, it became kind of, it had the earmarks of a cult. For those of you who remember Occupy, there was what was called the open mic, where the first row of people would say something and then it would be repeated by the second row and then the third row. And as I said, it had the aura of a cult. And it felt as if many of the people participating, long-term participants, those who stayed in the um, camps, the occupied camps, uh, they seemed marginal to our society. They were the ones who were, in many cases, homeless. That's why they were sleeping in the camps. But Bernie Sanders, the movement that emerged under his leadership, Bernie Sanders was the heart of American society. Now, it was a large part youth, but no, I, well, it was also, you would say, 20, 30, 40 year old workers. Um, but it was definitely the heart, the center of American society. So, for the first time, I would say since the Great Depression, for the first time, there seemed to be a potential to revive the values of what I referred to earlier of that leftist tradition, the anti-capitalist tradition, the socialist tradition, the class struggle tradition. That was what suddenly emerged. And you might say it's no accident that the person who uh, brought, who I don't want to attach excessive significance to Bernie Sanders, but he, he, the most, the historic significance of his campaign is it brought to life or to the surface, not to life. It brought to the surface this political potential. Now, what is this phenomenon called woke politics, cancel culture? What is it? In my opinion, it's fundamentally, if you define the left as I did, now other people will define it differently, but if you define the left as I did, it's fundamentally an anti-left phenomenon. It has these basic constituents. Number one, it reflects the Democratic Party's t attempt to instrumentalize identity politics in order to create a new base for the Democratic Party. For the longest time, the Democratic Party was anchored squarely in the trade unions. And the trade unions were hugely powerful in the post-war era. In fact, we all knew the names of the leaders of the trade union movement. Uh, they were common household names. So if somebody would mention the current strikers, the United Auto Workers, everybody knew it was Walter Ruther, a very common name, the head of the powerful uh, trade union movement. And then he was succeeded, if my memory is correct, and I think it is, by Leonard Woodcock. 
And then there was the United Steelworkers Union, the United Mine Workers Union. Uh, these were powerful unions. I don't have to be the one to tell you that with globalization and the export of jobs, the union movement disintegrated. And that meant the base of the Democratic Party had disintegrated. And the Democratic Party tried to has tried to replace its base with the um, identity politics. Now, I want to be clear about something here. The Democratic Party also was the home for uh, uh, aspects of identity politics. For example, most uh, African American political leaders worked with and within the Democratic Party. Martin Luther King, obviously, he wasn't part of the Democratic Party, but a large part of his platform was directed at Lyndon Johnson, who was the president of the United States from the Democratic Party. And also, I think it's correct to say that women saw the Democratic Party as the more progressive one to work with organizations like the National Organization of Women. But still, on balance, it was the trade unions that was the primary base, and then there was an, uh, an identity politics supplement to the Democratic Party trade union base. Now, it's true that the Democratic Party has tried under Biden to keep its working class constituents, um, most recently, as in the last week, Biden at least formally endorsing the UAW strike. What's going on behind closed doors? I'm a little bit suspicious. Not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I am a little worried that Biden is going to put pressure on the UAW to cave. We'll wait and see. And the other end, the, dem the balance has now changed, and it's the identity politics, which is the prominent component of the Democratic Party base, that's easily demonstrable uh, when you look at the lineup of speakers at the Democratic Party National Convention. I go through the record in my book. Workers barely had a voice just barely had a voice at the convention. It was almost entirely given over to identity politics, um, to identity politics constituencies. So that's the first aspect of identity politics that I would stress, the displacement of identity over class. The second aspect of it I would stress is that identity politics has a very limited economic goal, a very limited economic goal. The goal is described as ending the disparities. What does ending the disparities mean? It basically means that we want in that upper tier, that 1% or that 20%, we want proportional representation for minorities. Now, historically, the left 
that was never its goal. The goal of the left historically has always been a dramatic, drastic redistrib redistribution of wealth. The identity politics does not call for a redistribution of wealth. It calls for, as I said, ending the disparities. If there is, if there are in the within the one percent, if twelve percent of the one percent are African American, then the goal of identity politics has been achieved. But that means that for everybody else, let's say within the 80%, you have ending of disparities. What that means is black workers now get to live the same life as white workers. Well, given the current distribution of wealth, that's no great shakes. So the goal, I was struck, I was reading the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, its recent um, decision on affirmative action. And it was very striking that the two dissents, those by Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, the only thing they spoke about was how unfair it was, these disparities, and that the purpose of affirmative action is to assure that in the upper tier, there are going to be more minorities, Puerto Rican, uh, Latino in general, and Black. And for them, that would make the American dream perfect. Just end those disparities. Whereas, from, as I said, a leftist point of view, or from the leftist tradition, that's a very, a very limited goal. Uh, the goal of the left has always been the radical redistribution of wealth. The third thing I would say that uh, distinguishes the identity politics is that for minorities, it's uh, if you can get into the Democratic Party inner precincts, it's been a bonanza, uh, a financial bonanza. There are huge, the ruling elites have huge amounts of money now because of, I mean, they always had huge amounts, but now it's just uh, qualitatively different because of this vast, unequal distribution of wealth. And it's very easy to buy off virtually anybody and everybody. Uh, People like Jeff Bezos, they don't throw around $1 million. They don't throw around $10 million. They gave, he gave Van Jones $100 million. He gave Barack Obama $100 million. The former CEO of Twitter, uh, Jack Dorsey, he gave Ibram X. Kendi $10 million. Uh, the the uh, these people are handpicked by the ruling elite to quote unquote represent the so-called identity groups or constituencies, and they are um, very amenable to being bought off. Now. I want to just make two other comments, and then I'm going to stop, which is, as all of you know, the expression, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And if you had any doubt that identity politics is an 
anti-left phenomenon, you can see in two fronts, domestic and internationally, the reality of identity politics when it comes down from high theory, from the high theory of semi-literates like Judith Butler, to the realities on the ground. So here are the two illustrations. Number one, the Bernie campaign. When the first radical movement in the traditional sense of the left, when the first radical movement in nearly a hundred years, not since the Great Depression of the 1930s, when that movement emerged under the aegis of Bernie Sanders, the whole woke identity politics contingent coalesce to denounce Bernie. I'm not going to go now because it would take us too much time, but be it a Joy Reid, a Whoopi Goldberg, an Angela Davis, a ta Coates, on one point they all agreed to condemn, attack, undermine the Bernie Sanders campaign. That's domestically. They did it in 2016, and they did it again in 2020. Internationally, it's the war in Ukraine. So if you take the most woke, publications now out there. If you take the New Yorker magazine, if you take Atlantic magazine, if you take the New York Times, if you take MSNBC, this, these woke precincts, these identity politics precincts, are also the most fanatical, the most bloodthirsty, the most un unequivocal supporters, uncritical supporters of the war in Ukraine. It is a very sad day. It is a very sad day when the only people in Congress criticizing the billions of dollars being spent on the war in Ukraine, the only ones to criticize it are the far right. It's a very sad day. The left historically has always internationally been anti-war. Now, I will acknowledge, I don't want to misrepresent the record. Yes, it was pro-war during World War II. I don't want to dispute that. But there's a very different situation in Ukraine because that war did not have to happen. That war could have very easily, or the issues at stake, could very easily have been resolved. But it was the bloodthirsty, power-hungry, mad men and women in Washington who pushed and pushed and pushed until the war broke out. There was no need for that war.
Now, you may say to me, but what about Putin? What about this? And what about that? Fine. I'm more than willing to say that there's room for debate. I don't agree with the arguments that say that Putin wanted to conquer Ukraine and conquer all of Europe and blah, 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 blah. I don't agree. However, I'm willing to entertain and try to respond to those arguments. Now, here's the difference. The woke uh, precincts, the New Yorker, Atlantic, MSNBC, New York Times, they don't allow any criticism, none at all. No dissent is permitted. These are madmen, mad women, fanatics, but claim to be so liberal, so progressive, so woke. Well, if you go just a little bit beneath the veneer, it's a right-wing phenomenon. It's an anti-left. Okay, folks, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you so much. Let's see, does this work? I, we're creating some kind of a weird inception on that screen over there. Um, but I think people can see me, so I'll talk for a moment. Um, come around over here. So, can everyone hear? Can, Norm, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, Nance, could you uh, hit the lights and flip the projector around? Uh, we kind of, we were set up for one thing, then we decided to do another thing. Um, Norm, we were going to, so in the email, the idea was from my, because it was a miscommunication, but the idea was that uh, the organizers, we just really wanted to meet you, and so we, the event was going to go on as planned, but then we would get to, you know, come by your house after the event, which would be like 8 o'clock, at least meet you. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get the Underground Theory um, book signed by all the contributors for my mom, and, you know, it's just like a, she's, she's a Trump supporter. Um, she doesn't approve of anything we're really doing, except she does like, she, she likes the, how alive it makes us. She likes uh, that actually there is some commonality in our critiques of Democrats, right? Like there's, there's a little bit there, but she's ma mainly just proud of me as a mother. That's the only reason I bring that up. But I, I, uh, I don't know if we're actually going to have time for that. We did just receive um, a donation that wants to remain anonymous of $500, which is the amount needed to continue this event here for enough time to let the other two, well, three presenters go, which was going to, the, the, the original plan was that um, after Nick, Samuel Longcar, and Finkelstein all, or Norm, sorry, all went, uh, we were going to give you all the rundown on what Theory Underground is, uh, what these books are, uh, what we're doing, uh, and it was going to be pretty short. Each of us would keep it to three to five minutes, um, and then we were going to do a little panel thing, and, the, and the, the, we could have like a QA. and a um, And I know that the three of us, the, the organizers who are here on tour, are excited to have a little bit of a back and forth. Um, and so I don't know, what, what, what's your, do you have a, I don't know, another half hour here at least, Norm? Um, I think, let me just check what the time is. Uh, 7.16. Okay. I don't want to dominate the program because that's simply uh, unfair and wrong. What I would just like to make the suggestion, uh, if you like, let me field some questions and then you can move on with the rest of your program. Great. I love it. All right. Let's and by the way, folks on the live side, people who are watching YouTube live, do ask in the live chat what your questions are. We're going to start with the people here in this room. 
and also people in Zoom, if you've got a question, say amen, or Christopher, if you've got a question, go ahead and just put your hand up. I see Isaiah Holland is also in the chat. Good to see you, man. Um, so let's start. Questions? I think one thing I would like to hear then um, from you, Norm, while people get their thoughts collected, because obviously their minds were just blown away, and so they're still thinking, well, they don't have any questions. You just solved all the problems for them. But no, I have a question for you, and that is, um, could you talk a little bit about one of the things that is in your book, I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get To It, and that is your heroes and, and how they were silenced. Well, I have some basic criteria for what constitutes somebody worthy of uh, respect, worthy of honor. Uh, and the criteria are, I don't want to sound sectarian about it, but generally speaking, those were people who fell within that broad tradition to which I referred, the anti-capitalist, socialist, communist tradition. Well, that's obviously a large number of people. So there was a second criterion, which has always been important to me. And that is those who, when the going got rough, stuck by their guns. They weren't turncoats, they weren't, uh, what was the expression by Thoreau? Was it not sunshine soldiers, what did he call them? Um, I don't remember. But they weren't fair weather friends, they were willing to pay the price of their beliefs. And as I said, of course we all grow, of course we all realize mistakes we've made, or we should realize mistakes we've made, but to still remain faithful to those beliefs that animated us in our youth. And so I include among those people Paul, uh, Pete Seeger, Paul Robeson, uh, others who you won't know, I don't think, but they, gen they fit that general uh, description and uh, who didn't give up, let alone sell out. I mean, there are many who sold out, there are many who switched sides. Um, but then there are a large number who just acquiesced in, accepted, this is the way of the world. I, I preferred those who, uh, there's an old African-American spiritual, uh, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to get adjusted to this world. I got a home that's so much better, I'm going to get to sooner or later. I don't want to get adjusted to this world. Now, obviously, in its original form, it meant going to heaven, but then in its secular form, it meant the socialist tomorrow. I don't want to get adjusted to this world. I got a home that's so much better. I'm going to get to sooner or later. The socialist world will come to me. And um, that, to me, was always a hallmark of what it meant to be a leftist. I don't want to get adjusted to this world. It is for large numbers of people a disgusting world. And for young people nowadays, it's a precarious present and a futureless future. 
I don't want to get a job. Well, it's even worse than a future. This future may be a non-extinct future. It's a very real possibility. I think President Biden has put us on a, on a path to nuclear war. I think he and Blinken are completely mad. They're lunatics. And then there's the climate change issue. So it's a futureless future in a very literal sense, as in extinction. So I don't want to get adjusted to this world. And those I respected are the ones who were willing to bear the burden, as the African-American spiritual says, bear the burden in the heat of the day. Who were willing to bear the burden as tough as it got. For a lot of people, it got very tough. For quite a number, they were killed. That's, those were my heroes and heroines. Not the type who think it's radical to go skinny dipping with Angela Davis at Martin's Vineyard. That, to me, is not the radical tradition with which I identify. Thank you. We got a couple questions from the YouTube live chat, but if any of you want to raise your hand, go for it now. Or forever hold your peace. Oh, don't be intimidated by me. If you have something on your mind, just ask it. I know my ideas are in, in the process. I'm trying to figure out this whole crazy phenomenon called wokeness and cancel culture. So feel free to say, well, you know, I think that's an exaggeration, or uh, I really disagree with you on this at that point. Go ahead. Wonderful. Let's start with Isaiah Holland, and then we'll go to Samuel Loncar, who's here in the room. But um, I think Isaiah, a woman raised her hand in the first row, if I'm not Isaiah. mistaken. Samuel? Is it Samuel? Oh, I think you're talking about Samuel. We'll start with Samuel. Hi, thank you, Dr. Finkelstein. I was moved by your um, description of your parents and your critique of group identity, and I wondered if you could talk about the influence of your parents and uh, the influence of the trauma of the Holocaust and your your views about group identity today. Um, that's actually, unfortunately, it's a big question. I would say that my uh, parents obviously suffered uh, in ways hard to fathom by Germany's identity politics, if you want to call them that, under the Nazis. However, on a, another level which you will find hard to understand, and which I can't completely convey because my parents only talked in, on occasion and in scattered ways by what happened. But for you people, and I suspect you don't know any of the history, and that's just fine, you're not obliged to, um, they had experience when they were, when my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto, that was before they were deported to the concentration camps. They had a lot of negative experience with Jews. The Jews who ran what were called the Juden Retta, those were the Jewish councils. It was Jews that the Nazis appointed to do the dirty work of managing the ghetto and preparing the ground for the extermination. Then there were the Jewish police who were called the Kapos, K-A-P-O-S. And as you can imagine, there was in desperate times, in a desperate place, there was a lot of, let's say, manifestation 
of the worst sides of human nature as people did anything and everything to survive. And so my parents walked out of the experience, I would say with two definite feelings. Number one, I'm not saying it as a positive or a negative, I'm just saying it as a fact. They were very resolute that there was no God. They were fanatical, I think it's fair to say, they were fanatical atheists. And number two, they were very suspicious of everybody, including Jews. So they didn't suddenly feel a sense of solidarity with the Jewish people because they experienced a lot of the negative side of the Jewish community and Jews in general. And so I remember uh, I used to speak with my mother during the uh, 1990s on her experience during World War II and I would speak on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And there was an intended analogy in she speaking on the Germans and the Jews and I speaking on the Israelis and the Palestinians. In any event, at one occasion, a person raised I don't remember if it was a he or she, so I'll just say uh, his or her hand, and asked my mother, what is the main lesson you learned from the Nazi Holocaust? And her response was, there are good people and there are bad people. And that's it. And I understood exactly what she meant. She meant there's no good groups of people, like the Jews are good and the Gentiles are bad, or white people are good and black people are bad, or vice versa, black people are good and white people are bad. No. At the end of the day, there are decent human beings and there are indecent human beings. And that's all she saw. And that obviously had a very big impact on me. Isaiah? Hey, um, thank you for like taking the time to present and everything today. Um, what I wanted to ask you is that for people that see um, like what's going on today with all the different forms of genocide that is still currently going, going on concurrently to um, what you would call like the Holocaust industry. How do you see um, people that are looking towards like creating more of a connection between um, animal rights and current leftist discourse as like we see the, this as a form of, um, of like struggle that we also wish to include and how do you think that we should stay, stand steadfast um, in relation to leftists that actually um, want to create genuine change in, in the world and stand on authentic principles? I happen to be a vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian on moral reasons, not for, uh, not for uh, health reasons. However, having said that, I don't believe people can arbitrarily choose causes and make them political causes. You have a belief. You act on the belief. You try to convince others of your belief. That's called education. However, there's a difference between education and politics. Politics is when there is potentially 
or really a constituency, a mass constituency that's responsive, responsive to a political demand. So as I told you in my brief remarks, as I said in my brief remarks, I said the old-fashioned leftist ideas had no resonance in the 1960s. You can hold on to them if you believe in the idea of socialism, but it was very prosperous times for about 80% of the population. Um, and nobody wanted to hear about socialism, communism. It was like completely alien to their reality. It's like animal rights now. It was completely marginal. But then, as the capitalist system entered a new phase in which the middle class was extinguished, then a new possibility emerged because there was a mass constituency ready to hear the old socialist method, message of being anti-capitalist and pro-socialist. So then that message was no longer just a belief system or a value to which you clung it now became something else, you know, that something else is called, it became a political fact. And that's what I said, uh, that what Bernie Sanders' campaign signified was the emergence of the class conflict as a political reality in the U.S. So I would never tell you to abandon your belief in animal rights. And I certainly think you have every right to proselytize about it, but I don't think you can just pluck from thin air a political cause. A political cause requires the rightness of the historical situation. And neither you, nor I, nor anybody else controls that. The rightness of a political situation is beyond our control. It, of course, we can help bring it in, but it requires a lot more than proselytizing. In our case, it required the, as I say, the new phase in which the capital system entered, the phase in which it's failing about 80% of our country. Thank you. Yeah, the gong, definitely. I, and I also see the possibility for um, new technological forms that are newly emerging to possibly lead us to alternative systems of circulation other than cap capitalism. So, like, that because so i definitely see that and that's kind of like what i'm trying to do with my project right now um seeing different things emerging like cellular agriculture and stuff as being able to allow for different forms of reorganization and i think that taking the notion of like control of food and various other things into uh in a more concentrated form whether it's municipally owned or whether we can get to the point where it's privately owned by like households and stuff like that I see it as basically allowing us to enter into a new age of like management of like biopower in a sense. Um, so yeah, that's why I see like that as a new possibility on the curve. And I just wanted to know, like, how do you think it's the best way to kind of- I, I, like, I honestly, I honestly don't, I don't like to speak in topics where I'm not knowledgeable. And whenever you say technology, my whole system shuts down. I don't know anything. I never owned a cell phone. I never owned an iPhone. I never learned to drive. I never used an ATM. I'm way out. <laughs> I suppose only me and somebody in Inner Mongolia fits that profile. What I would say is that what you describe seems perfectly compatible compatible 
with a broad uh, economic agenda that's trying to address the new realities. So that seems to me perfectly sensible. I'm sure your project would have easily fit into Bernie Sanders' general perspective, uh, perspective on the economy. So that to me strikes me as more realistic. Um, I think there are just a large number of issues where it's not realistic now. And uh, that was one of the main things I learned from reading Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi, Gandhi's main insight in politics is, politics is not about telling people what's wrong. Politics, he says, you talk to people, they'll tell you a thousand things that are wrong with our society. <laughs> That's stupid. From the moment you get up in the morning and step out of your bed and you can, anyone can identify 10,000 things that are wrong with society. So you don't have to enlighten people about what's wrong with society. Gandhi said the real challenge is to get them to act on what they already know is wrong. You have to get them to act. That's the challenge, not to tell them what's wrong. They know what's wrong. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, our challenge is take things where people already know it's wrong and then try to mobilize them and get them to act on it. But if people don't have a consciousness that something is wrong, it's very hard to get them to act on it. So most people do not think it's wrong to consume animals. Just don't. I do. But uh, when you try to get them to see it's wrong, I kind of agree with Gandhi. There are so many things wrong with the world. Why not focus on what people already know is wrong and get them to act on it? At least correct something. At least get something done. So uh, you didn't have to convince any black person that segregation was wrong. The problem was to get them to act on it being wrong. Yeah, and yeah, that's, that's what... And that's the Gandhi... For me, that was the main thing, one of the main things, I learned, I learned many things from reading Gandhi, but that was one of the main things I learned. Don't try to impose your agenda on what's wrong. People already know a lot of what's wrong. The problem is they don't act on it. Yeah, and that's something I see, like, especially in when we're talking about, like, things like um, formulating these things as agendas, um, like Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders's platform and stuff like that is like, I think like right now, and like this is something applicable, I think to like any new form of capitalist formation is that there's like a time of opportunity where we can kind of think about the structures and try to give them implemented in a way that can kind of short circuit it being uptaken into capitalism, of course, like legally and stuff like that. There could be ways in which that can be taken away. But, like, I do like the idea of, like, the political emergence at that spe in specific times where there's kind of, like, an anarchy, a space of anarchy. And I think that we need to, like, understand. And, and that's why I think notions of, like, eminence is very necessary. Because if we can be more eminent instead of transcendent, like you were talking about with the proselytizing and stuff like that, then we can see these um places where we can, like kind of undercut that from which the transcendent formulation will like try to take up well bernie's platform was brilliant he took four or five issues where he knew about 80 percent of the population already knew what was wrong medicare for all abolish student debt abolish college tuition jobs in public infrastructure uh you get, you already have 80%. You didn't have to convince anybody of that because the polls already showed 80% were supporting a Medicare for all. 
And that was the brilliance of his campaign. He chose slogans which he knew already. He didn't try to educate anyone. Of course, he filled in some facts you know, about prescription drugs, comparing the cost here with the cost in Canada, or the fact that we're the only major industrial power in the world that doesn't have a single payer system. He filled in facts, which is important, educating, but people were already there on a general level. They already wanted that single payer system. It was clear. And it was the same thing with the college tuition, student debt, and so forth. So he, he did what a good political actor does, in my opinion. But bear in mind what he didn't do. He didn't try to create an issue which wasn't yet an issue. He didn't bring in animal rights. For all I know, he supports animal rights, but he understood. You have to reach people where they are. You can't just pluck from thin air an issue and try to uh, impose it. It's not going to work. That's not how politics works. I think that's correct. Now, let me just check the time. It's already 7.45, and I didn't eat dinner. I didn't eat anything yet, and you don't want me to expire. Well, maybe you do, so you can say you saw Finkelstein give his last talk, but <laughs> I would rather at least live for another few days. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I wish you the best, and um, just give me a call, uh, the organizers, just give me a call when, you, when your program is over, and we'll talk, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Take thank care. you so, so much, and as I said, I think there was a misunderstanding somewhere, but no big deal. That's what life is like, and we had a chance to meet, chat, and discuss. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. So what we're going to do before we close out here is hear from the organizers. Uh, normally, on YouTube especially, uh, when, you, when you see a speaker at a university campus, actually, this is a weird way to say that. If, if I was speaking to students, I'd say, normally, when we see someone come to campus. But what I'm saying is, on YouTube, when you see a person come to a university campus, right, workers tuning in to intellectuals on campuses. You will hear the student organization give a talk. And sometimes one of them gives a talk and then introduces another one who also gives a talk. And then you get the actual person, uh, the person that everyone's actually there to hear. Um, at this point, the person that you were all ostensibly here to hear has, is no longer here. So that's uh, cool. But if you'll stick around for a hot minute, um, what we're going to do is kind of take some of the threads that have been raised by Nick's talk on difference as such, by Samuel Longcar's talk about the sort of historical and material basis of this thing that gets called cancel culture, and then uh, Norm's talk. And we're going to kind of tie that together into sort of what we're doing on this tour, what the Underground Theory volume is all about. And we're going to start with hearing from and Snellgrove McCarricker, who will be basically talking about the book itself. And so all you need to know about her, I think, for now, is that she's got a background in social science, that she is a, an instructor at Theory Underground for both the idea of the university course as well as critical media theory. Please put your hands together to welcome Anne Snellgrove McCarricker. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're very appreciative of all the support of people who have purchased our book on Amazon and on um, theoryunderground.com. We are so grateful to everyone who's contributed a piece, Norm, Slavoj, Nick, uh, Samuel, Nance, you know, all the people. And so I just really quickly wanted to come up here and kind of talk about, uh, first of all, this tour, why we're doing it. I'll talk about this underground theory anthology slightly. I'll talk about our critical media theory cohort and how it relates to cancel culture a little bit. Uh, and I'll try to be brief because I'm sure we're all getting hungry and just wanting to chat. There's so many fun ideas and I, I want to talk to everyone as well. Um, so this tour, we've been all over the United States and even up into Canada uh, doing events that have brought no, peop no people besides, you know, the speaker that we wanted to 
meet up with and then obviously an online audience to events like this where to us this is a great turnout like truly um and this tour has just been about figuring things out and figuring out the limits and and learning and meeting people in we've all nance dave and i and like andrew McLuhan have all been calling it the the meat space so it kind of has two meanings uh the meat, like our meat, our bodies, we're in the space together. Our bodies, our energies, we're here meeting each other, and then that leads into the meat space. Like, we're really, we're really meeting each other, even though we've had dialogues online before. You Maybe you don't really know someone, or maybe you can't really say you've met them until you've, like, met in person, or I think, as Dave said, you're meeting them again. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, we're meeting people, having real-life uh, events that pull us out of our screens, that even though, you know, we're engaging with the screen right now, but it's a little bit different. We're, we're talking, we're having dialogues. We're also, you know, Nance and Dave have been conducting a lot of interviews with some of our contributors. Last night, they got a nice interview right outside of Times Square, right after the Broadway show with Samuel. Um, so we're working on a documentary. We're, we're figuring out how to do hybrid events with a projector and people on Zoom and people on YouTube and people in real life and people, you know, we're figuring it out and so i'm sure dave and nance will have some more to say about the tour but that's what we're doing is we're figuring it out but we're also on tour to promote this book that we uh put together in the last five or six months here uh underground theory coming to a city near you well here we are in new york city um this book is an anthology of people who agree with each other and who disagree with each other like Daniel Tut and Nina Power there's kind of an ongoing dialogue between them and their different perspectives you know there's there's leftists there's post leftists there's socialists and there's people who are none of the above featured in this anthology and I think in an age of cancel culture and identity politics where you have to platform the right person and you are not allowed to platform anyone who doesn't 100% agree with what you think uh, we say we say fuck that, you know. This is we've been we've been throwing around those words. We say no. We say that all voices that have something important to say, that want to have a dialogue, should have the space to do that. You know, regardless of cancel culture, um, regardless of what they think, so long as they're not saying, let's kill a certain person. You know, obviously we're against that, but. I think every single person in this anthology is critical, is, is thinking about these things, is against this cancel culture. Um, at Theory Underground, our initial, our first course was the idea of the university, where Carl Jaspers, you know, envisions the university as a community of truth seekers and academic freedom is one of the most important and fundamental aspects within this ideal university and we try to uphold that sense of academic freedom um, and so I think that's really featured in this anthology there's really rigorously academic pieces there are funny pieces there are poetic pieces there's, there's something in here for everyone I, I think every single piece you know stands on its own and is worth is worth reading and engaging with and so we hope you are able to buy the book you can get it on uh, https colon forward slash theory-underground.com slash store. Uh, if you're international, you can purchase the book on amazon.com and it'll ship to you. And then for those here, we have some physical copies of the book that we will be selling. Um, and the last thing I'll say, just in relation to critical media theory, um, you know, part of Theory Underground is also we're, we're an experiment in critical media theory, trying to engage with everything that's going on socially, culturally, in a critical way, and understanding the technologies and the way that they're fundamentally changing us and changing our humanity and our humanness and, and disrupting our ability to have genuine solitude, time with ourselves, and genuine solicitude, time with others. Um, so we've developed a course where we try to engage with some philosophy and theory around media and mediums. You know, the McLuhan medium is the message. And um, yeah, that theory and philosophy, as well as some practical texts and some texts that we can take the theory and the, the basis in that and then apply it to our lives to have a better you know, relationship with our devices, to have a better relationship with others. And I think within that, and it's something we haven't really explored yet within the critical media theory cohort, but is obviously very relevant, is this idea of cancel culture. Because part of critical media theory is having media literacy and media and digital literacy um, and trying to figure out what to do in an age where everyone has to walk on eggshells within the university on the internet where academic freedom seemingly is stifled um, in certain spaces um, 
And so, you know, in, in my own experience trying to, en to engage with that and, and understand the medium and how I can use it to get my voice out there on issues that, like, I'm not even going to say because the issues that I care about and that I have criticisms of, um, women are getting, you know, you can, you can figure it out from this, but, like, women are getting literally silenced and literally physically assaulted. And, you know, it's, it's scary in, in terms of, how the medium and how this cancel culture then comes out into real life and is affecting real people. And so it's something to talk about. It's something that we want to engage with and works like Samuels, like Nick, you know, really trying to theorize identity. Uh, Norman's personal experiences and his analysis are very important in the field of critical media theory and trying to relate it to what the heck we're doing and how to make social change come about. And so that is what I have to say about kind of the tour and the rundown. Um, next, we're going to hear from our good friend Nance and our fellow traveler Nance. Um, fellow traveler in the sense of theory underground and also our fellow traveler. He's, he's coming with us. Um, he has truly been, like pretty much from the beginning, the biggest uh, theory underground supporter in terms of just time energy that he has put into this project. You can tell that he really cares and believes in the cause. Um, he offers a nice balance, I think, in our space between pessimism and optimism. And he's done, he's put in so many hours of reading and writing and really engaging with the dialogues. And he has some, a, a really unique and wonderful perspective to contribute to all of this, the cancel culture, the critical media theory, thinking about time energy. And so please welcome our token skateboarder punk, Nance. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Um, I listen to guitar music, hardcore punk rock, metal, and there's a song by Ice-T's band, uh, Body Count, called Bitch in the Pit. Uh, and if, if that offends you, I apologize. But if, if you like metal, if you like loud music, um, listen to Bitch in the Pit. Anne's the Bitch in the Pit. <laughs> and that's a really good thing. Um, it's a term of endearment. So, the last three weeks have been really crazy um, because it, they, they have been like a radical break um, from the doldrums of daily life. Um, I've had an opportunity to get outside of, to get outside of my routine. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet people that I've interacted with on the internet and actually physically come together and hug them and high five them and and hang out with them. And that's cool, that's really fun. Um, but it, it, it also changes something about our relation to one another. It changes some of the dynamics, some of the understanding. Like, it's, it's just more. Like, on the internet, we can kind of agree, we can kind of disagree. Usually I'm quietly sitting back and observing because I don't feel like I have much to say. But in the real world, we can have more. Um, and, and that matters in the time of uh, we're, we're always being told we, we're getting more, we have it all. Everything is in instant access to, to an infinity of, of anything you could ever want, but it's, it's all ephemeral. Nothing is real, everything is bullshit, nothing matters anymore. So getting outside of that um, and driving 3,500 miles in the last three, two and a half, three weeks. Um, and coming to cities where contributors to, to the volume and people who have had long conversations and, and worked out concepts and issues that have gone into these books. Um, it's more than just um, having fun. It, it really is um, an experiment in a new form in, in, in a new medium. Um, and thank you all. Thank you all for, for being here and checking that out. I, I wanted to say a couple things that, that really stuck out to me over the last um, couple days. And it has been a long couple days for me, so I am a bit spacey right now, so I apologize. But one thing that really stuck out to me last night, um, after the, the musical Gutenberg, when Samuel said the, the volume was I can't remember your exact words, but you said it was, it was excellent. Um, 
And that made me feel really good to be included in something and, and to be such a, such a big part of or, or feel welcomed into something that is excellent. My whole life, um, yeah, I've just kind of been a malcontent. I've been disappointed. I've been some version of leftist or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's never really meant anything. It's always been, it's been bullshit. It's been flattened, meaningless bullshit. Um, and I imagine college people feel a similar way. I don't know. I'm not a college boy. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think we're all aware of just this empty space. Um, so I really do believe that what we're doing with a bunch of laptops and a bunch of cords and a bunch of technical errors and a bunch of uh, opportunities for improvement. Uh, I, I really do believe um, we are moving into the future, or at least we're trying to, and we'll die trying. Um, and then last night on the way home, when we were on the subway, um, Dave and I were, I don't know, we were spacey, it was three in the morning. And for some reason, we started reading some Marshall McLuhan. And uh, we were reading it aloud to one another. And in the subway car, um, as I started reading, there was kind of a cacophony of cell phone noise and conversation and people talking. And, and as I was reading aloud, I became aware of the fact that all that kind of faded away. And there was silence, and my voice was filling the space, was filling this New Jersey fucking metro cabin. And I was reading Marshall McLuhan. Um, and that felt amazing to me. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone gave a shit other than to say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> but I imagine it, it, it did. I, I, it felt like, at the very least, someone on that subway car will ask bigger questions, at the very least. Maybe they won't read Marshall McLuhan, maybe they won't give a shit. Um, but I don't know, it, it felt like at the very least something happened last night. Uh, and I believe that's, that's radical, you know? Fuck all the bullshit. It is what it is. Um, we're trying new things. And at the end of the day, I'd rather try new things than do the same old fucking bullshit and uh, go on Twitter and, and uh, talk shit and shit on the covers of books. When nothing but the cover of the book was released, there were thousands of people judging it. Um, and I don't want to be a part of that anymore. And I really do feel like this um, is fucking awesome. So with all that said, once again, I do apologize. It's been a very long day for me. Um, Dave is going to come up and, and close us out, and uh, once again, thank you all so much for your time. What's up? We haven't lost anybody. Everybody's still here. A couple of people maybe left, but, you know, for the most part, everyone's sticking around to see what the hell's going on over here. And so. I guess I kind of have to take a couple threads and tie them together into a little bow, or if I fuck up, maybe it'll be like a piece of trash that someone will toss in a garbage can somewhere. I don't know, but I'm gonna try. And so what I wanted to talk about were some ideas, um, some acronyms that have gotten tossed around. Um, the first idea is time energy. The, the, the second one is an acronym, PMC. The other one is an acronym, CMT, right? All of these relate. All of them relate to cancel culture, to identity politics, to understanding our historical situation, where we are in the world today, why there are um, seemingly, uh, what's the word, for things you can't get out of. I don't know. We're stuck, right? And so um, Time Energy is the other book here on tour. Maybe someone could grab me a copy of that so I can wave it around on camera. But um, it's my baby. I've been working on it for a long time. And uh, this book, just this is my second book. The first book was called Waypoint. Kind of like to say, hey, there are other people I've been in dialogue with, intellectuals, fellow travelers. This is a point along my journey as a thinker, 
A lot of the things in here are really just things that I reference, and people go, where, where can I find that writing? And then it was in Waypoint. But the, t the subtitle of Waypoint was Time Energy, Culture War, and Critical Media Theory. Very carefully chosen. Um, Mikey was like, don't have a subtitle. He was like, just, just call your book what you're going to call it and stick with that. And I was like, no. I want people to know. I'm talking about time energy. I am dealing with the culture war. And critical media theory matters. What is critical media theory? Well, media theory is the thing that Marshall McLuhan founded in the same way that Freud founded psychoanalysis, in the same way that Marx founded Marxism, in the same way that or you could also say sociology and critique of political economy, right? But Marshall McLuhan is, you know, he famously said the, uh, the medium is the message and, the, and we're moving towards the global village and post-literate man. And he talks about media not as like TV and uh, talking heads, pundits on television. No, he's talking about media as extensions of man, he says, right? Human extensions. But of course you think, well, that's just technology. Technology is a human extension. Yes, in a sort of like objective sense, there are technologies and that they give us this like uh, leverage over nature, right? They help us speed certain processes up, right? But media, it's more focused on that subjective side of things, right? In the sense that our perception, Kant's transcendental categories, Dasein, whatever you wanna say, us being in the world, perceiving, interpreting, that is always mediated. And of course, if you're thinking Kantian, then you're thinking, well, it's mediated by those categories of the mind. Well, true. But what he's talking about is the fact that writing itself revolutionized how we engage with the world, how we see ourselves, how we act with one another, how we engage with the world. Writing is a medium. Another medium is your skin. Another medium is the electric light bulb. These are media in the sense that they extend our sensory organs. It's not just about our powers over the world, it's about our actual uh, sensory apparatuses. And the fact that a medium can, is, can extend one sense over the other ones and bring things into a kind of stark relief against all of the other senses. And so he thinks that literary man, Western man specifically, because it kind of has to do with the alphabetic, uh, alphabetic writing, is the kind of person who's been able to critically step back from reality and gain a sort of distance on it and then strategically act on it in a way that is more or less, and this is a feminist critique as well, exploitative. Now that's not the full, whole picture. It also allows us to do amazing things. but. Um, to think about what we are in the world today requires understanding how different forms of media mediate our sensory apparatuses in different ways. And something that he profoundly believes, and I don't know, we, we're, we have our questions about it, but it's like the idea that pre-modern people, and that's a fucked up way to say it because they still exist right now, contemporaneously with us, but that is to say like hunter-gatherer peoples, nomadic people, whatever, um, are immersed in the world in a way that we're not, and that their senses are not compartmentalized in the ways that ours are. And there are advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages for them is not having super uh, uh, elaborate forms of technology. They're not able to defend themselves from us, and that sucks. For them, it's great for us, right? Well, not if us is the working class and we're also getting fucked over by that process, right? Well, this is also alienating in a different way and that is to say that like, we're not just cut off from nature in some weird way, we're cut off from our own senses. Like certain media bring out our senses in specific ways. Now Marshall McLuhan levels a critique against Marxism. He believes that Marxists do not understand the changed media landscape. And this is why they privilege the base over the superstructure, the productive relations, the factories, etc., over the cultural realm and the ideas, the ideologies that are competing, taking our attention away from what's going on at that material basis. And McLuhan says, um, 
that, that's actually more important in the age of media. And if you don't understand that, you can't change the world. And I think it's very interesting that all the Marxists I know in organizations start newspapers in a world where no one gives a fuck about newspapers, except for socialists, who are all history buffs. They're history buffs, and they're making newspapers. And I look at that and I think, ah, I have a brother who dresses up in armor and takes a sword and goes to the Renaissance Fair and plays with other people. We have a word for this. It's called LARPing. And I think it's LARPing to be making newspapers nowadays. Now, of course, I'm open to being corrected on this. I am open to the idea that people are hungry for the written word again and that an effective way of reaching them is to put this newspaper in their hands and selling it might be a good way to raise funds. I'm not fully against this, but I do think that it tells us something, it shows us something, and that is that they read thinkers who wanted to change the world, like Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Mao, Che, Castro, pick your person, right? If you don't like any of them, then you go for Rosa. But the point is, is you have your revolutionary thinker, they wanted to change the world, but they were writing in a time when there was such a thing as a public and that public was created by the newspaper and now the newspaper is not here and we don't have a public. We have something special here, some kind of like a, an actual manifestation, objectification of the big other like we all have like this agency of like this idea of society in our heads and we are in relation to it and that's how we form our identities sure but then there's real people and most of the conversations we have with one another are kind of vis-a-vis -vis that big other and it's just this idea and we click with the people who have kind of a similar enough idea of that big other and then we have our conversations uh, but what about real people Real people don't live siloed in algorithmic echo chambers. Real people, people aren't consumer demographics, preordained, prefigured hashtags. Okay? That's where we're at today. People are like, oh, I'm a leftist. Yeah, and then this other person's into playing with swords. And this other person's into playing with video games. And then this other person's into collecting pins. I don't care. I'm interested in changing the world, and what people who are mostly interested in changing the world do is they get addicted to a kind of media content that makes them feel like they're on the right side of history, and what it does is it sucks away any potential for change. The people who are most online are the least likely to actually show up and do anything. But also, as I was saying earlier in this stream, I don't know anymore. I'm very unsure about what is an effective way forward in a world where the left versus the right in this country have become complicit in the maintenance of a duopoly. That the idea of a strong uh, consensus and of a silent majority that was held together by, first by the newspaper and later by the television, that that is gone. It's not this strong middle that keeps away the margins, the extreme left versus the extreme right, and then there's a battle over the Overton window. That's changed. And now, every idea is on the table. We are in an information overload, and people think they're talking to the public when really they're just talking to like-minded people who are jacking off and eating ice cream while listening to someone who gives them confirmation bias, and they feel like there's actually hope, but in reality, this is the dance party at the end of the world. I would like it to be more than a dance party. Theory Underground gets its name from the idea that, hey, there's a lot of similarities between music scenes, underground ones especially, and the media scene that is called theory today, right? It's a lot like a music scene. But the difference is, is like in a music scene, most of the people involved are like, this is about my heart, my feels, the community that we build around, the music that makes us vibe, whatever, right? Outside of punks, most people don't think their music is going to literally change the world. Within the theory scene, people think it's gonna change the world. My question is, or my assumption is, at its current state, it's not. 
we might develop a better understanding of Foucault versus Derrida versus Marx versus Lacan versus Zizek versus Hegel versus the ancients versus the medievals versus fucking whatever, dude. But like outside of like our education, what is it really doing? And I do think that there's potential here. I think that there's real hope. But outside of a scene made up of consumer identity, uh, consumer demographics that are selling us identities, outside of that, is it becoming a genuine intellectual milieu? An intellectual milieu, I believe, is the basis for any movement, and that we haven't had a genuine movement since the 60s. It's been repeating old left versus new left talking points. And I think there's a lot of truth on both sides, old left versus new left. The basic division, for those who don't know, is like one was focused on the working class, the other one was focused on civil rights. And they, yeah, there's something there for both sides, but we've also moved on in a very real sense. There are predetermined consumer demographics, people who are willing to keep throwing their money at anybody who will say working class, and then people who are willing to throw their money at anybody who will say Black Lives Matter. And the world continues on. But in, more, you know, in a very real sense, there were successes in those movements. Workers did get rights. Workers did win the weekend. Workers did get, for a while, higher page, uh, wages. There was a welfare state that came after the Great Depression as a way to counteract the Eugene Debs in the United States and the Lenin in Russia at that time, right? The uh, self-conscious professional managerial class at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, saw what was going on and said, uh, these workers are going to fucking kill us, dude. We better do something. Let's give them social security, right? Let's, let's also like put some laws in place that make it impossible for unions um, to really be radical. For instance, if you find out that, there is a that one of the organizers has a communist history or an anarchist history or a socialist history, they can be removed. There were laws put in place to make it so that radicals could not be in trade unions. And... You know, what did we expect? I don't, I don't think anybody who was aware of the actual stakes of the situation at the time expected anything different. This is why people fought and died for these things. I have a shirt that says, thank a union. And then it says, for the weekend, for, the, for this, for that, for not having child slaves, blah, blah, blah. And I feel conflicted wearing it because a lot of unions are just fully embedded in this whole thing, right? They are a PMC in that sense, right? And there's nothing wrong with being a professional. There's nothing wrong with being a manager. There's nothing wrong with it if you're self-conscious and aware of where you stand, of your time, energy, relative privilege that you hold over other people, and then you sympathize with the people you're supposed to represent who don't have the education that you do, and you say, hey, I'm the one who's radically responsible in this situation, not them. That's why I care about the idea of the PMC is because it is the responsibility of representatives to realize they have a special situation. They're not the same as a regular rank and file. They're not. They can't be. And so when they say, well, I'm a worker too with my salary and my credentials. and Shut the fuck up, dude. No, you're not. Oh, I don't like the way you use PMC. It sounds like a slur. Yeah, because I get resentful and angry when you keep fucking acting like you're the same as the person who has no prestige, no honor, no hope, none at all. And you say, oh, we're the same. Just, psh, it's the 99% versus the 1%. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that there's a 10% that's over the other 90%. And they say, we're the same. And it's been that way since the 60s. And that the 60s, in part, was, a, a, in part was defined by the realization of, of students, oh, shit, we're in a special historical role. Okay, the enlightened progressive PMC that wanted to create class conciliation at the time of Frederick Winslow Taylor, who created Taylorism, right, wrote the principles of scientific management, or of Eugene, uh, Eugene W. E. B. Du Bois with his The Talented Tenth, or of Bernays with his propaganda. If you read these guys, they're selling the idea of themselves to capitalists so that they can stop working class organizing on the ground. They were self-conscious PMCs. 
Then that was kind of forgotten for a little while. And then in the 60s, it was remembered for a little bit. But it was never really formulated in a really good way. And of course, edgy teenagers that become institutional shills eventually, as they do, they were like so radical. They were like, fuck humans, dude. I just care about animals now. Fuck humans, dude. I just care about the planet now. Fuck workers, man. They're basically all just reactionaries anyway. Now, that's not wholly fair. I understand. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I don't have to be fair. They're not fair. I've never met a PMC person who is not self-conscious about their role and their radical responsibility, who I think is fair, right? So I don't think that I have to be fair. I don't think we do. But also, I can be sympathetic to the normies in my life who just aren't theory buffs. And I get it. I don't hold them to the same standard that I do people who say that they stand for everything, social justice on the left or freedom on the right. This is kind of the big divide. Freedom, family, nation, and on the other side, social justice, Black Lives Matter, climate justice. If you're not down with climate justice, you're a white supremacist. If you don't wear a mask, you're a white supremacist. If you're not for climate action, then you're not for land back, then you're not for reparations, then you're not for... They just always have this laundry list, and then they like to change the definitions of words and move goalposts around so they can do what Catherine and Lou, who we'll be meeting up with in LA, calls virtue hoarding, which is to say taking your educational capital, your social and cultural capital, and lording it over people who don't know better. And also, I just framed it in a way that's very congratulatory, and this is actually a way that the PMC likes to frame it. Sympathetic ones will say, they just don't know better. There's never on the table the possibility that we're just wrong. That's one of the big things with anti-racism today. Kimber, Kimber Max Kendi, uh, Robin DiAngelo, these HR well, workshop racial consciousness uh, facilitators never think about the fact that they just might be wrong. Robin DiAngelo wrote, wrote a whole book about how, no, nope, if people don't want to talk about race, it's just because of white fragility. Could it be because they are precarious in the workplace and they don't have the time energy to actually research things for themselves and you're sitting here telling them, well, this is the correct take to have on this. And anybody who's an adult who has intellectual integrity goes, well, fuck, I would actually have to spend some time reading a lot of different books, taking on a lot of, diff a lot of different viewpoints. I would actually have to, to understand a field or any subject matter, as we've been saying a lot, requires understanding the constituent contradictions of that field, of that subject matter which includes the main players in that discourse who wrote the main works, who developed the main concepts from whom issue the main contradictions. If you don't understand them, you don't know where you are in the field. And the thing is, is for someone like Robin DiAngelo, they don't give a fuck. Fuck you, you need to get back to work in a second, but first nod your head along and tell me I'm right. Trust me, I know, I'm an expert. I call this discursive Taylorism. So if Taylorism develops to uh, monopolize certain skill sets and put those behind uh, certain kinds of uh, qualifications, certifications, regulations, and keep the de-skilled workforce down below or outside of the walls, as Nance would talk about in his piece in Underground Theory, what am I saying? I'm saying that it makes sense. It makes sense to, as to a certain degree, to elevate um, and to concentrate um, skills into professionals and managers. It does make sense. Um, Lenin believed in it. I mean, that's not authoritative for me. I don't, I don't think he's authoritative on much, but I can at least look at him and go, oh yeah, he at least got that, right? He believed that Taylorism makes sense. We're gonna be meeting up with Chris Catrone in Chicago in a few days, and he's like, yeah, Taylorism's not bad actually. And I think, yeah, um, in any, prof any future that we might want to be in, there will be professionals and managers. There just will be. The question is, do they get to have the power to tell everyone else that they can or cannot be included in society and access to things on the basis of what they say? And this is what I'm calling discursive Taylorism. It's the stay in your lane. I have this certification, you stay in your lane. If you didn't do well in school, shut the fuck up. Or subscribe, follow, like me not these other people. If you follow them, then you don't really deserve to have a job. Or as this person on Twitter said about us, people who purchase this book should be barred from public life. 
So that's the PMC idea, and it matters to me because I'm just a working class nobody who tried to go to the university, and I thought I was a leftist, and then I just kept having encounters with leftists, and I was really weirded out. I was like, something's wrong here. And for a while, I theorized it this way, and then for a while, I theorized it that way. And then eventually, I was like, oh, this PMC thing, there's something to it. And people are like, well, it's not a class. I don't give a shit. It's a mediating organ in society. It's a specific group of people. It functions a lot more like a cast. I just say it's a professional managers of capital. That's still PMC, so I can still maintain the acronym. But how that relates to time energy, well, it's obvious. They have relative time energy. Workers don't, so workers can't research things on their own. So what is time energy? It's not just time and energy mashed together, which would also be cool. No, the neologism is to make it intuitive to regular working people. That's all. But what it stands in for is the thing that becomes labor power in a society that sees you as nothing but labor power. Oh, you can get things done, disappear into the background so I can focus on my self-actualization, right? Clean my house, shine my boots, keep our plumbing going, etc., etc., etc. Time energy, though, is defined as large energy-infused repeatable blocks of time throughout the week. Nobody has it. What we have is energy without repeatable time that you could actually use to, say, learn the violin or other languages or higher math, right? No, that would require discipline and re repetition. But all of our discipline and repetition with energy and repeatable time revolves around work. In the same way that we have energy without repeatable time, we also have time without energy. That's what we mostly have. And so when we think about critical media theory, when we think about people addicted to scrolling, when we think about people sitting around canceling people because they don't feel represented in this society and the people who do seem represented in this society don't seem like they deserve it and so why the hell are they there and so we get angry, this is because we're stuck just scrolling with garbage time. And garbage time is the technical term for time without energy. It's what you have at the end of the day. It's what you have at the end of the week. And if your dad or your mom ever had some energy on the weekend, it wasn't the kind of energy that could be reliably harnessed towards nonprofit directed ends. And that is why there's so much dysfunction. And that is why there's so much anxiety. And that is why there's so much depression. Oh, it's your brain. It's your brain. It's your brain. Oh, yeah. We're just a bunch of brains. I forgot. I forgot that we actually need nurture from people who actually have some life force to be able to respond and engage with us so that we can develop our maturity vis-a-vis -a, -vis a robust constellation of so social reference points and role models, right? An extreme example of needing that constellation of reference points and role models I went to Belize on a service learning trip for a class that I took at Boise State University called Global Responsibility, no, what is it called? Global Citizenship and Social Responsibility. Very cool class. And we helped out at Chan Chan Elementary School um, and we were all very aware that white people love to come and take pictures and do the thing and then never come back and so it's, it's a kind of like a pointless thing and so we're, this is like a class that comes every year and they try to create some kind of continuity and they try to get a lot done, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know. Is it white saviorism? Maybe. I don't fucking care. Look, what was impactful on me though was that I had a bunch of children, I don't know what grade, I don't know what age, but they were roughly around the age of 11, 10 years old, you know? And the, the thing that I was supposed to assign them in the schoolroom, because really, they just wanted me to speak English in front of the kids. Because if these kids can learn English, they're gonna have a way out. But if they don't have English, there's no hope for them. Because without English, you don't get to go to college. And without college, what do you get to be? Well, I, didn't, I wasn't really thinking about it until I actually read their assignments. And so what, what the assignment was, um, write a letter to your future self in a year and say what your favorite color is, what your favorite food is, and what you want to be when you grow up, right? And uh, with the, there, was, there was a lot of very interesting things that came out of that, like because I made the mistake of asking people to say out loud what their favorite fruit was, first kid says bananas, the next kid says apples, and then from there everybody says apples, bananas, apples, bananas, apples, bananas, and I was like, oh God, 
they're not able to think outside the box of what's been set on the stage here, right? It's very, we like to think red versus blue, Pepsi versus Coke, apples versus bananas, dogs versus cats. And so of course I was watching that happen and I was like, shit. But I, when I, later when I was reading the, uh, the cards, one of the kids wrote as the answer, um, Sorry, that was the answer to favorite fruit. The answer to favorite food for almost all of the kids, and I found this out later because this wasn't something they said out loud, but almost all the kids said rice and beans. And I remember thinking that was weird because rice and beans is like basic and they have Fritos, they have Doritos, they have all kinds of snack foods and Snickers and stuff. They're at the school, trash all outside because they litter it because they don't know. Um, and I'm like, or, or probably because the school's undermanned, right? There's just not enough people working there. But um, one kid wrote, not rice and beans. That's the food I don't like. I like chow mein. And I was just like, fuck yeah, kid. Well, that's an anecdotal aside because it's cute. On the way to saying that the very sobering realization that relates back to this idea of constellation reference points and how important that actually is, um, is that the answers to what they wanted to be when they grow up was... Mother, teacher, pilot, doctor, that's all. They don't know anybody who's anything outside of those four jobs that they want to be. Most of their parents are just mothers or sugarcane hand handlers. I don't know what we call them, but the sugarcane farmers, right? You would see in the early morning on your way in, all these trucks full of guys. I mean, they're packed back to back, shoulder to shoulder, in the backs of these trucks that are going off to the sugar cane fields. Guatemala's for coffee, Belize is for sugar, parts of Africa are for the rare earth minerals in our phones, India's for tea and spices and shit. Like, this is still true today. And the real world result of, is that kids are being told, you have to learn English. If you don't, you'll never go to college and you can never become either a teacher or a pilot or a doctor, which is your options, right? But growing up, I didn't even think about those as realistic possibilities. When I was five years old, they'd say, bring out your hats. And then I'd, I'd like bring out all these hats for different things I wanted to be, a detective, a spy, a soldier, a fireman, blah, 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 please. I had like a whole collection of hats and I'd wear them and I'd, I want to be these things. I want to be all of these things when I grow up. Um, but that idea wilted away and it was replaced by, I want to like be cool. I want to, I just want to be cool and have fun. I want to drink. I want to hang out with cool people. I want to be accepted. I want to be a part of a music scene, uh, outside of work, but the rest of the time I'm working. And that was just my entire reality. Somewhere between, oh, I can be anything. And of course, everyone kept telling me that and being an adult, all of these possibilities died. Well, why? And now with theory, looking back after a decade in the workforce before I was in college and I continued working, I was like, I didn't have any role models. I didn't have any realistic, plausible sort of role models. This is why in Time Energy, I talk about Churchill with his, okay, in the summertime, he'd go off to the summer home of the Rothschilds and be there for a couple weeks, hanging out, uh, swimming, rowing, playing weird British games that they play, um, you know, golfing off a horseback or whatever the fuck. Um, and then the, I mean, I, I use the Rothschilds because we all know the name, right? But there's a whole litany of names, most of whom aren't Jewish, I should say. I just don't know the names, but there's a whole litany of uh, names in that quote. And the point is, is that these are the wealthiest families in British society. And he, because he was born into the aristocracy, goes and hangs out with them at their summer homes, right? He got to see not just a bunch of statesmen living their fully self-actualized lives, he also got to see all kinds of explorers and adventurers and people who are doing really exciting stuff. He got to be with famous authors and all of this at a very formative age when everything was on the table, everything was possible, and he had his relative time energy because he was not in an education system that had turned skole, which means leisure time, 
into schooling, which means the regimentation of your, t of your time, the constant thinking about deadlines, and the reduction of all of the fields of knowledge into factoids instead of actual robust relationships between human beings trying to understand subject matters, which is the very idea of the university, a plurality of people coming from a bunch of different backgrounds, because we all have our own standpoints and experiences, trying to understand the world together. That's what we're trying to do. That's why the first class at Theory Underground was about the idea of the university. That's why the second class at Theory Underground was about the professional managerial class, consciousness design and ideology. And that's why we've been doing all these other courses ever since. It all ties together, and I'm really excited to say that Time Energy book is officially out, and I will be leading a seminar on Time Energy, and we'll be going through the history of philosophy and theory, drawing from all kinds of thinkers, from Aristotle through Adorno, uh, talk, and Baudrillard back to Plato, back and forth, the whole history of thought in how it relates to ideas like leisure, freedom, and time and time thought of as something that's not just this linear infinite regression of isolated moments that are to be turned into profit as quick as possible, otherwise you'll die or end up homeless, right? But that's where we are. And I talked way longer than I actually wanted to, but I just have to say, um, this is what we're about. Thank you for listening to me. I wouldn't have talked for this long if it wasn't for the anonymous donation um, because obviously that person wanted to see us talk. And so I wasn't going to just say, okay, here's my thing, Gu goodbye. No, someone wanted to hear us talk so much that they paid for us to have this space for longer. Of course, we could have taken it outside and live streamed off the street. It would have been weird. I think the hotspot probably would have run out really quickly. And so thanks to the donation, we were able to breathe a sigh of relief and actually just do this, I think, properly. And so there's a lot of people tuning in for the first time to Theory Underground. They came for Samuel Longcar. They came for Norman Finkelstein. Most of them came for Nick Casalucci. But they're here. And thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to a bunch of nobodies who are experimenting with new forms of media and integrating them in a lecture course platform and social media site run by a single person. Uh, it's crazy, it doesn't really work. The app, which I spent six months developing and getting out there, is broken, it's not really working right now. But I like the idea from that show we saw last night at Gutenberg, which is that success matters less than keeping the idea alive. We're getting drunk on words, it? We eat dreams. And we eat dreams. We're dream eaters. Now, I don't want to just get drunk on words and high on farts. We're not just navel gazing. We're trying our best to turn this from just a scene into an intellectual milieu. But what that requires is actually tarrying with texts with other people engaging with those in a robust way, not just reading quick to get your take, but actually going back and forth and having dialogue that doesn't just happen in the space of one Zoom call or one course, but actually stretches for decades. And so what we have right here in Underground Theory is the first time that I have gotten most of my fellow travelers or people that I think have a lot of interesting stuff to say and I wish would communicate with one another all in the same book. And it's going to be the basis from which many more tours will, will follow, many more volumes will follow. We have like three volumes coming out next year. They're all very small compared to this one. Um, but they're on specific topics. And you'll just have to stay tuned for that or ask me off camera and we can talk about it. But basically, we're doing a lot of things. We're really excited. And we'll be in Washington, DC on the 19th. We'll be in Chicago on the 22nd. We'll be with Daniel Tut in Washington, DC. Chris Catrone and Platypus Affiliated Society in Chicago. And then on the 27th, we'll be in Claremont, which is a satellite of LA, and that's when we'll be with Catherine Liu herself. And so I, this is just a really cool tour. We're meeting a lot of really cool people. You're all welcome to come to those events, and so are you. I mean, anybody who wants to take the time off work and then go to Chicago, we'll see you on the 22nd. And funnily enough, the space that we're going to be in in Washington, D.C., on the... On the uh, what, uh, no, da, 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 what's it, the 19th? 19th. The 19th, with Daniel Tut. It's going to be at Comet Ping Pong. Uh, Ping Pong? Ping Comet Ping Pong Pizza. Comet Ping Pong Pizza. <laughs> you live on the internet, you should know what If you is. live on the internet, you know that's the place that almost got shot up by someone who thought that the Pizzagate conspiracy theory was real. Um, and so, what's that? Yeah, we're going to the 
basement. Our meeting is in the basement. No. No, in the back room. Get me some adrenochrome. Yes, we'll, we'll be drinking adrenochrome cone with uh, Daniel Tut. Got, got a whole tap of it, yeah. But anyway, um, I hope to see you guys there. And with that, we're going to close this thing out. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Peace.